Broadcasting across the internet, this is an Unshackled live stream. Brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Now, here's the Unshackled team. Hello everyone, we are live across the internet. Welcome to the Unshackled Super Saturday election night live stream. We are live on the Unshackled's Facebook page and for the first time our YouTube channel. I'm your host for this evening, Tim Wilms, Editor-in-Chief of the Unshackled and joining me at the beginning here is Stephen Cable from the Cable Critique up in Brisbane. How are you Stephen? Good, how are you Tim? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Now, the seat in uh, Queensland is up north in, in Brisbane, uh, Longman. I'm not sure whereabouts you live in, in Brisbane, but do you know the area well? I don't know the Longman area well. I live in uh, right smack bang in the middle of the South Bank in Jackie Trad territory. It's as red and green as you can uh, find in any seat in Australia. Uh, but up in Longman, it's got a very interesting history. Uh, it was the seat that uh, was held by Wyatt Roy, who uh, suffered the curse of Tony Abbott in the 2016 election. And like so many of the other people that uh, stabbed him in the back, he uh, ended up being turfed out. And uh, the current uh, Labor uh, member there, Lamb, was elected in 2016. It's generally speaking a, uh, a Liberal seat. So... Um, it's not normally a Labor seat, at least not historically. Yes, much has been made of the fact that uh, Susan Lamb, she won based on One Nation uh, preferences and probably what also went against the, the incumbent LNP, Wyatt Roy, was the fact that he was one of the, the Turnbull uh, plotters at the, the ripe young age of uh, 25. Uh, he was pretty burnt out by his time in, in politics, even went, I believe, to uh, Iraq to relive his youth. So the, the LNP, they uh, pre-selected Trevor Ruthenberg who used to be a, a state uh, MP during the uh, Campbell Newman years. Yeah, um, and as uh, Malcolm Turnbull said when he was up here, um, Big Trev is as honest as he is big. <laughs> it was a hilarious interview that uh, the Prime Minister did there. Uh, it's been a very interesting election campaign up here in Longman. They've been throwing everything at it. Uh, Bill Shorten's been throwing everything at it. Uh, Labor knows how important it is for them to keep that seat. Shorten knows how important it is personally for him uh, to keep that seat. It's been a quite an interesting campaign. We've seen some very interesting things happen up here. We've seen Labor Party attacking the One Nation candidate, who is a tradesman, a, a tiler, I believe, by trade. And here you've got the party of the working class, uh, supposedly, going all out to criticise and attract a tradie. Why he's not their candidate uh, shows you just how far they've departed from the working class they're meant to represent. And uh, he was also a candidate for One Nation in the state election. And all this dirt that they've been supposedly digging up and throwing at him, uh, none of that surfaced in the state campaign. But now there's a massive national focus uh, on this uh, seat being retained by Labor. Uh, they're pulling out every single dirty trick and funny trick as well. Uh, in the absence of Pauline Hanson, they've got a heap of cardboard cutouts of Pauline Hanson all over the electorate that uh, people compose with. I was just talking earlier on to uh, a good friend of mine, a very good friend of mine who's in One Nation, and I asked him his opinion of that. And uh, he said, yeah, it's a bit of a gimmick, but people really love them. So uh, apparently taking a photo of yourself with uh, the cardboard Pauline is almost as good as taking a photo with the real Pauline. Uh, yeah. Interesting sideshow. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think um, her not being there, although uh, a lot of people apparently, or their supporters really want to meet up with her, uh, from a purely political political philosophical point of view, you would want the party to start branching out past that one person and bringing other people to the fore in campaigning. Uh, so uh, this guy is a true blue working class guy and he just wants to see a difference be made. So uh, having Labor attacking him is, uh, is quite amazing. Uh, the uh, uh, liberal guy that you just mentioned before, the LNP candidate, uh, apparently he can't get his acronyms right he was awarded a medal and uh, in stating what medal he got, he got one letter wrong. 
I don't know why or how, uh, but apparently it's a big deal if you are in the medal winning business. And uh, according to a news poll, uh, that's turned some people to uh, say they're not going to give in their vote. So apparently it has had some sort of effect. Yeah, it's... Uh, but the main issue here is the reason we're having this uh, by-election is because uh, Susan Lamb, uh, she, she took... Uh, she was under a cloud for, for so long uh, over dual citizenship, and then, of course, she tried to weasel away out of it, saying, I was abandoned uh, by my mother when I was six years old. Uh, this is too traumatic uh, for me, which, of course, we learned uh, wasn't true. Uh, but... Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> The, the law is still the law, and the law doesn't care for, for sob stories. And when the, the Katie Gallagher decision uh, was handed down, that pretty much uh, knocked her out because the, the High Court uh, ruled that uh, if you are still a dual citizen by the time you submit your, your nomination, then you're ineligible. Uh, reasonable steps doesn't include uh, simply taking steps to uh, renounce it. You have to be just an Australian citizen by the time of your nomination. So I think that there's be a lot of people who be still pissed off with with Susan Lamb rather than uh, Trevor Ruthenberg just listing uh, service instead of defence medal on his on his bio, and he was pretty apologetic for it. I mean, he uh, apologised yeah. to the local RSL president. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, we, we weren't um, uncovering a, a fraud like that there was uh, in the the WA state parliament. No, nothing like that. I mean, if you if you want a comparison, the um, Queensland government here has just sacked the entire Ipswich Council because of uh, some allegations and wrongdoing going on there. And that's something pretty serious if it's true. Uh, he's the guy who gets one letter wrong. Uh, so, yes, I mean, in the big scheme of things, it's not a big deal. Uh, and you're right, uh, the waterworks that Susan Lamb turned on didn't work. Uh, polls showed that... Uh, uh, nobody was really impressed by it, but the people who are still going to vote for her were the, the ones who would have anyway, being Labor supporters. Uh, it's, it's not making a huge difference in the votes. Uh, just about all the commentators uh, agreed that the biggest impact is going to be held by wherever the One Nation preferences go. Uh, a week or so ago, they were polling at about 18%. Uh, now it's down to, I think, about 14%. Uh, which is up from the 9.4% it was at the last federal election. Uh, so quite a quite a, a good chunk of votes there. Uh, the uh, One Nation is directing people if they would like to follow their advice to give their preferences uh, to the Liberal candidate. Uh, but historically speaking, One Nation voters don't follow those how to vote cards too closely. Uh, one of the very interesting things about One Nation that uh, despite all the attacks and criticism that Labor level at them uh, is that a very large part of their membership are ex-Labor members and uh, their first preference, so their second preference ends up going to the Labor Party. Yeah, it's a, a, everyone's talking about uh, at the the last election. It was uh, that's what uh, got Susan uh, Susan Lamb over the line. The uh, One Nation preferences. Now, even though Pauline Hanson said she's going to preference the LNP, uh, One Nation voters they don't like being told uh, what to do, and they direct their own preferences. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They do, and uh, the LNP would need to get more than seventy percent of the One Nation preferences. Uh, for Ruthenberg to win, uh, which is historically, uh, if, if the history is a measure, that's very unlikely. So um, short of any sort of dramatic thing, I think that the uh, uh, Susan Lamb's probably going to get re-elected, despite the fact that Australians hate having to go to by-elections. <laughs> Well, we're currently not on YouTube at the moment. This is our first time on, on YouTube. I was trying to figure out uh, how to uh, basically get it so that we could stream to YouTube, YouTube Live. I noticed that we have zero viewers on YouTube, and I thought that was a bit strange. So I'll, I'll try and work on uh, fix it, uh, fixing it when uh, you're having a good uh, rant, uh, Stephen. No problem. Uh, so, and of course, we must not forget that the other uh, poll that's closed is Braddon down in uh, Tasmania. That's in the north uh, of Tasmania. Uh, that's uh, where uh, towns such as Devonport and, and Bernier. Uh, Justine Key is the local 
or is was the incumbent uh, Labor member uh, knocked out by dual citizen. Uh, the uh, Liberal candidate is Brett Whiteley, who uh, he was the member for uh, Braddon during 2013-2016, uh, and he was also the state member for Braddon from 2002 to uh, tw uh, 2010. So. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, he's, uh, it's a contest between two uh, seasoned politicians, uh, both uh, Braddon and Longman. The news poll today, uh, they, they were both at uh, 51.49 Labor. And if you've been following the betting markets uh, today, uh, you'll have noticed that the, the odds have uh, shortened, if I may use that pun on Labor. Uh, Labor is now the favourites to pick up these seats. Yeah, it's looking that way. I Obviously, I live in Queensland, so I'm not completely up with Tasmania, but I was doing a fair old bit of reading of the uh, seat of Braddon. And uh, it seems to be the ultimate swinger state. Um, it's very unlucky, I suppose, from uh, Labor's point of view that these uh, two seats happen to be so line ball. Uh, one of them swings backwards and forwards and has for decades, which is Braddon. And the other one is a seat that... Uh, had it not been for the White Roy debacle, they probably never would have got to start with. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot on it. I mean, the uh, leader of the uh, Liberal Party, Prime Minister, and Bill Shorten have visited both seats many times and, uh, you know, been out and about on the hustings uh, with full force like any normal full-on federal election. Yeah, it's, uh, they've they've brought uh, they've been all over the place. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten, of course. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, leadership uh, uh, chatter about uh, both, or particularly for for Bill Shorten because he's he's never been uh, particularly popular. Uh, and there's Anthony Albanese who's been uh, sniping. Uh, for for the pa uh, uh, for the past month in the in the in the most polite way uh, as possible, I'm just restarting uh, YouTube again. Uh, so yeah, you take over for a moment, Stephen. Yeah, well, for both um, both leaders, there's quite a lot riding on it. Uh, for uh, Shorten, a win is a win is a win, and uh, if he retains it, you know he can fend off all those sort of suggestions and allegations that uh, somebody else should take over, despite the fact that the news polls are showing that Albo uh, is probably going to be a little bit more popular. But that always happens because it's human nature to think to yourself and believe, oh, this other guy is probably going to be a little bit better. But if Albo was in charge and subject to all the forces and pulls of uh, Labor Party wranglings and factionalism, uh, he'd probably find it just as hard to sort of come up with a workable solution to what his party wants to shorten does. So uh, if you swapped them six months ago and then did the same thing, or if Albo had won the leadership when Shorten had and you did the reverse poll, you'd probably find something very similar. Uh, on the other hand, if Turnbull was able to win one of these and really pull something out of the bag, and uh, I'd say Longman was probably his best chance to do that, uh, that would do tremendous things with his leadership. If he was able to do that and win that or even two of them, there's a, a really good chance he could go to an early election instead of waiting till next May uh, because it was showing just how much on the nose the uh, opposition really is. He would smell blood and, and uh, maybe go for it. Yeah, uh, definitely. It still says we're offline here on, on YouTube. Uh, this is, but uh, luckily our Facebook viewers are here. No, wait, I saw something there. Uh... We have got someone on YouTube now. Welcome. Uh, Welcome. It's it, it's it's one thing to perform uh, on camera live. It's it's another thing when you've got to do all the the technical things as a one man operation as well. <laughs> well, hats off to you. Yeah, we're getting viewers on YouTube. So I was trying to figure this out uh, all, all afternoon because uh, at The Unshackled, we're, we're jack of all trades. We do everything ourselves. Um, I was trying to figure out how to properly stream to YouTube, and I thought that I was doing the right thing by scheduling a, an event, but it didn't quite 
uh, work out. I see we've got a few viewers now on YouTube. Welcome to our new subscribers. Um, they, they were sent over to us uh, over the past few days by uh, the great Aussie YouTuber uh, Bearing, who liked our uh, Lauren Southern and Stefan Molyneux Melbourne event uh, Antifa footage. Fantastic. Yep, so uh, we hope we can put on a, a good show for you tonight. I mean, uh, election results are not as entertaining as Antifa antics. <laughs> well, <clears throat> um, I think another issue to sort of you can discuss over this election, and uh, uh, we've, we've certainly seen it here, um, and that is um, this uh, organisation that is completely unpolitically affiliated, totally neutral, but just always seems to happen to advocate things that are Labor Party policy. And I'm talking, of course, about get up. So the Libs are actually livid with them again, and they're demanding that the AEC look into them because, uh, as we know, they're just nothing but a front for the Labor Party. Uh, they're their campaigning arm and also campaigning for the Greens. And uh, so they should be. Uh, if they want to play in the political football field, uh, they need to be subject to the rules of the referee like everybody else. Uh, I'm not on board with that. I mean, I don't view a get up as a, a arm of like Labour and the Greens. Yes, they, they recommend you vote um, for, for Labour and the Greens most of the time, but uh, I, don't, I, I don't like onerous um, electoral uh, restrictions because political speech is, it's, it's free speech. And so I think it's important that activists, no matter how much we dislike them, uh, they should still uh, f have the have the freedom to to put their funds in a in a campaign they believe them. I don't hardly agree on get up on on anything. Uh, I just think uh, conservatives just need to stop bitching about get up and uh, get better at activism themselves, which every, all conservatives say we need to get better at, but nothing ever gets done. Yeah, conservatives do need to get better at it. In fact, conservatives need to get better at a lot of things. Uh, but it doesn't stop you, uh, doesn't mean that someone who's pretending to be a neutral uh, side player advocating for their uh, favourite things, all of a sudden, every time an election comes along, just so happens to constantly campaign for Labour and Green policy. Just take this current campaign at the moment. Uh, when they put forward the things that concern their members the most, which is normally things like the environment and sort of social justice warrior issues, all of a sudden, come this election, all their major points just so happen to be Labor Party policy. Uh, they are a front for the Labor Party, and uh, if they want to be campaigning, they need to do it by the rules. Whatever those rules are, if the rules were to change, say nobody had to register for anything, uh, fine, then uh, let's do that. Uh, but if that's the rules at the moment, they need to play by them. I've got the, the AC tally room out at the moment, still uh, zero, 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 so I'm not going to switch. We'll be able to beam the, the results on the on the screen uh, when they when they come in. Um, but yeah, so far, uh, nothing's come in at the moment. And probably people who've watched uh, a lot of my Unshackled content will notice I'm wearing glasses tonight. This is because the, the broadcast, live broadcasting software that we're using, it has tiny the tiniest writing you could imagine. So I have to have these glasses on to basically squint to, to see it so I don't open open the wrong window. Cool. Uh, I, I was mentioning before, before I got uh, flustered with all this technical stuff is, yes, uh, Bill Shorten's been under the pump uh, from Alban Albanese and uh, because uh, the, the statistic that, that's always brought up is that no government has won a by-election from an opposition seat uh, for uh, uh, since about 90, 90 years. And so, and, that, and that's a mm. good way for uh, Malcolm Turnbull and his uh, supporters in the Liberal Party to play down their uh, prospects, saying, oh, we're, you know, the underdog. Or, and so if they lose tonight, they say, oh, well, uh, their history was against us. I mean, and... The, the numbers in the parliament will stay as they be, as they were before. Yeah, well, statistically is correct. Uh, that is the case. Uh, if there was any seat you could do it with, you'd think it would be longer. Um, but uh, not likely, I don't think, considering uh, what the polling is showing. One of the things about political polling in Australia, because it's compulsory voting in 
uh, compulsory preferencing, uh, it can give you some pretty fairly accurate results because when people tell you they're going to vote for someone, they have to legally go and do it. So uh, unlike other countries where it's just, oh, yeah, well, I may or may not. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's true. Um, winning one off the opposition when you're in government is pretty hard. Most of the time, Australians uh, love giving the uh, party in power a good kick in the gut. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely true. Um, just uh, people who are, are watching on Facebook, just let us know if there's, there's any issues because we are stretching the, the internet uh, quite a bit. I see that it's buffering uh, here. So we've only got, um, yeah, the, the viewers are dropping off uh, Facebook, so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Still good my end, I can see you clearly, mate. No buffering whatsoever. Oh, I'm looking on the live stream. Yeah, I think we're, we're stretching the, the internet here, so I might have to uh, turn off YouTube, I'm afraid. Hopefully that uh, fixes it. Is that the NBN helping you out there? No, we've got actually proper business internet there. So, oh. um, yeah, we're hoping it's better, but it's not not the the, the fiber optic uh, one. Anyway, back on to the, the business of the night, and we're getting some results in for uh, Braddon, I believe it is. So as you can see here, um, just in uh, wait. If I go down here, we've got um, just the primary votes at the moment. So uh, Craig Garlin, the independent, 40, 49 votes. Justine Key, 42 votes. And Brett Whiteley, the Liberals, 68 votes. We have to remember that uh, Craig Garland's uh, preferences there, they're all going to uh, Justine Key. That's why it's predicted that uh, she'll get over the line. Mm -hmm. Now, why don't we go over to Longman, because these are very preliminary results. No, we've got no results for Longman at the moment. So I'll just bring us back. So it's, uh, <coughs> what's that? it's nearly 6.30 now, which means that the, the polls are nearly uh, closing in uh, Mayo in South Australia, which is a seat up in the Adelaide Hills in the, the outer uh, Adelaide area. Uh, Rebecca Sharkey from, she was elected by the, uh, from the Nick Xenophon team. Uh, she, uh, of course, was knocked out because of the dual citizenship saga. Uh, Nick Xenophon, uh, he had tried to have a, a crack at uh, state uh, parliament, which was unsuccessful. So because Nick Xenophon's not there anymore, uh, it's uh, now uh, the Centre Alliance. And uh, Rebecca Sharkey, uh, she's up against the, the Liberals' uh, Georgina Downer, who uh, now even though the seat of mayor was held by her father, Alexander Downer, for 24 years, uh, Georgina Downer has spent most of her active political life in uh, Victoria. So she's considered a, a fly-in uh, candidate. And so the locals there, they want to stick with the local, which is uh, Rebecca Sharkey. Yeah, I'm very pleased to see that it's not just Queensland here where people don't know where their country is their citizens of. I'm glad it's sort of evenly spread throughout the country. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, uh, I think it's just uh, that late Sharkey's uh, to win. I, I am no fan of political dynasties whatsoever. Uh, you look at that seat of Mayo and are you telling me that out of approximately 150,000 people, the best candidate just so happened to be the daughter of the Liberal guy that had been there who hasn't even lived in the state for two decades. Uh, it's that sort of um, uh, nepotism that goes on in political parties uh, that really irks the electorate. It, I don't like it at all, and I've got no sympathy for a loss in that situation. Yeah, uh, she's she's been in the media for quite a number of years. She she worked at the the Institute of Public Affairs, Georgina Downer. She's been trying to get pre-selection in uh, Victoria, but there's been a lot of um, factional upheaval uh, in the state, which she wasn't on the the winning side on. That's why she's uh, gone home. But yeah, I've seen her on TV. Um, yeah, heaps of times, and I've never been that impressed by her. She doesn't she doesn't come across as 
sincere. She she always comes across like she's trying to say the the right thing, the the acceptable thing, and yeah, I, I I've I, I just don't think she's cut out for um, being being an MP where you've you've got to have that authenticity. Yeah, look, that certainly helps. You'd have to be uh, in an incredibly safe seat to sort of um, not have those skills and still win, uh, like Turnbull, who completely stacked Wentworth and uh, and got himself a very nice safe seat there. So yeah, you, you're quite right. And all the other parties that are sort of running there, they're all going to be uh, sending their preference to Sharky's way to ensure that the Libs don't win that seat. So uh, it looks like that's very much going to be retained. Uh, by the current member there, I would say. Yeah, um, it just it's still the the stream is still not loading on my iPhone. I don't know if it's just my iPhone or not, but it's it's unnerving me. But everyone says that everything is coming through uh, clearly, so just uh, keep the comments coming to know that uh, you can still hear us. And if you want us to to look at any uh, particular results or to discuss uh, any candidates, uh, please let us know. Uh, in the comments in case everything is going to cactus at the moment we have got the the local recording which we'll uh put up so uh we're, we've got that uh, back up uh we may see go back to longman to see if any votes have been counted yet no no votes counted yet in longman uh so still waiting on that we might go back to uh Braddon. And if we see, oh, there's been a bit more uh, movement in in Braddon, as you can see there. Uh, is there a two-party preferred up there yet? No, there's not. Uh, Justin Key always way out ahead now on 113 votes, 35% of the vote. Uh, Brett Whiteley, or oh, he's down to 96, 29.8% of the vote. And the, the independent Craig Garland, uh, uh, 64 votes, nearly 20%. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it's oh, I'll bring us back. Uh, so it's looking good for for Justin Key uh, at the moment. I, I mean, Longman was always uh, considered uh, much more uh, of a, a line ball uh, electorate, and I, I've just got Sky on in the background as well. They're able to calculate the swings better than me, and uh, yeah, it's. Everyone's primaries votes down. It's all going to to Craig Garland. Mm. I noticed that uh, another player, a national player, got involved in this election in the uh, last few days, uh, and that was the uh, the Catholic Church was ending up sending out letters advising everybody through the schools that uh, their schools are going to get more money under the Labor model than the, uh, the Liberal Party model, and uh, do with that what you will. But um, that is thought that is probably going to have quite uh, a bit of an influence too in the Longman electorate. Yeah, it's, a, it's interesting there, the, the Catholic Church going all in with the, the Labour Party. I mean, they, they were traditionally mm. uh, a Catholic uh, Party, Labour. There was a big split with the Catholics uh, uh, in, the, in the 50s. But uh, the, the Catholic Church, they were opposed to... Um, Oh, officially uh, same-sex marriage, which probably Labour campaigned more more than the the LNP, but they seem to have forgiven all that and uh, yeah, all in with uh, Labour. Yeah, they, they certainly seem to be at the moment. Um, you know, there's billions of dollars at stake. So uh, who knows what else is happening behind the scenes there, but I, I find that very interesting. Uh, now that that battle's over, it's all back to business as usual. Who's going to be getting what, <laughs> where? Mm. Yeah, uh, it's and, cold, and been... hard politics. Oh, well, that's been Labor's been up to their usual tricks about uh, health cuts, uh, about uh, the, the the class warfare, and they even revived some of the the Medicare st uh, stuff, saying there's going to be money uh, pulled out of the the Caboolture Hospital. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, Bribe Island clinic's not gonna not gonna go ahead. Uh, they're the usual uh, scare tactics, and it's interesting. Malcolm Turnbull said that uh, he he was never gonna get a, uh, let Labor get away with lying again. But it, it's just so easy for for Labor to to scare people. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be health to get on and education to get on with. Um 
uh, if the, if the uh, Liberal Party doesn't get stopped. And of course, it's going to be heaven on earth uh, if the Labor Party gets elected. It's, it's the same thing. Um, we're going to spend more money on health and education, and this is going to just be so awesome. But you really need to examine what they mean when they say we're going to be spending more money on these things. Uh, when you say you're going to be spending more money on uh, education, uh, particularly if you're spending more than above the inflation rate, uh, which means you're obviously putting more resources in real terms into the education system, exactly where is that money going? Is it going into more administration? Is it going into unnecessary services? Is it going into their pet projects? Is it going into another uh, gender diversity program or something of that nature? Is it going into better or higher sort of wages and conditions or more days off for teachers? In other words, are students actually going to benefit from that additional funding? It's just one of those amorphous terms that gets thrown out there. Uh, it's very much like the last federal election where Turnbull had his mantra, jobs and growth. Well, what does that mean? Uh, does it mean more jobs in the government sector and a higher GDP tick? Is that what you mean by jobs and growth? Or is there actually going to be more real actual private sector jobs that give a meaningful income? and give real growth to the economy rather than some artificial inflation number. Yeah, I, I mean, well, like, like I said, uh, La Labor's mantra at the moment is class class warfare. And yep. uh, uh, there's uh, if you've seen the, the core flutes out today, it's that uh, uh, the, the LNP candidates, they want to give all the money to the, uh, the, the big banks or they don't want to fund uh, health, health and education. Uh, it's, 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 yeah, like I was saying before, it's real uh, old school stuff. Yeah, it's old school and uh, it's, it's kind of like what you get if you combine old school uh, with um, radical student politics. It's, uh, it's the sort of lines you'd expect to read in Green Left Daily. It is uh, weekly. It's, uh, it's, it's incredibly childish thinking and very shallow analysis. Um, and yeah, look, he's going to get, everyone knows full well, it's been proven time and time again, uh, that if you give tax cuts to business, i.e. let them keep more of their own money, they're going to spend it on growing their business. And if you grow your business, you need more staff. And if you have an economy that's dynamic, uh, everyone's going to be fighting for staff. And one of the best ways you get them is you give them a higher wage or better benefits. And that allows you uh, to have the real genuine growth in the economy, real better paying wages, not some uh, Labor Party mandated central control system where we're going to start ordering everybody what to pay you. Uh, tax cuts are a proven effective way uh, to give growth and give opportunity uh, for new employment. Uh, back in 2008, the immediate response from the Labor Party uh, under the Rudd government was to spend more money from the government as a response. They could have achieved far more, much better results if they had given a tax cut, which they were in a fantastic position to do because we had such an enormous surplus from the Howard Costello years. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. And we're still, uh, I saw it on Sky last night that, uh, even though it was over, it's been over ten years since uh, Kevin Rudd first became prime minister. We're still paying the price. Oh, absolutely. You always pay. I mean, it used to be that you know everyone knew. Oh, gee, when Labor gets in, you're just going to have huge debts, and then some. When the Liberals get back in, they're going to pay it off. But they've given up on that fight now, as we saw in last year's budget. Uh, they basically handed down the Labor budget, and. Uh, uh, now both the parties in power have given up on controlling that debt. Now, I listened to a speech uh, some months ago by uh, John Anderson, who some may remember was head of the Nationals and the Deputy Prime Minister uh, for a period of time there in the Howard government. And uh, they said as a matter of priority, they thought it was their responsibility to ensure there was no intergenerational debt. It is not right to take the problems of today and drop them on the children of tomorrow. And uh, that is so important. And yet both the major parties have given up on that. And they are quite ha happy to saddle uh, my children and grandchildren uh, with a massive tax debt. We're talking millions of dollars of interest per day. And all of it was completely unnecessary. 
Yeah, and it, it's it's been turbocharged not just by the stimulus package of 2000, 2008, 2009, but also in the dying days of the Gillard government when uh, she locked in uh, Julia Gillard as Prime Minister Gonski uh, school funding, which I don't know where all this extra funding is going, but then there was also the, the NDIS uh, as well, which is, is going to uh, basically consume the budget in years to come. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I read a number of uh, something like it's predicted to be twenty billion dollars. Uh, I forget uh, the time frame for that. Uh, but again, it's just committing a future generation with money you don't have. And uh, it seems that that used to be the curse of Labor. Now it seems to be uh, the curse of both of them. And we desperately need a political force in this country that's going to kind of, uh, bring that under control. Uh, it, it's. Uh, it's a terrible situation. The problem is it's very hard to get the population awake to it because you still get a job, you still got food on the table, you can still watch the football at night and have a beer. So, you know, what's the big deal? Uh, but, you know, the chickens will come home to roost and it takes proper foresight and, you know, taking responsibility for the consequences that have come later down the road, but taking responsibility for them now and getting it fixed before the crane hits the tower, you know? Okay, so I've just got uh, two party preferred for uh, uh, Braddon. So if we have a look at that, and Justine Key is easily ahead. She is on 61.5% uh, 61 of the two party preferred vote. And that all goes down to that uh, uh, independent, the, the, the preferences uh, from Craig Garland, who uh, I haven't mentioned it yet, but there was uh, a lot made of his uh, conviction for assaulting a uh, policewoman uh, a few decades ago. But uh, he's he's a green uh, independent. Uh, uh, I think uh, recreational fishing is uh, stopping that is one of his his big issues. Yeah, I, I can really imagine going to an election saying you're going to stop recreational fishing will be a really big winner in Australia. Oh, it's got him enough votes. <laughs> yeah. Not on the right side of the ledger, apparently. No, uh, definitely. So we're still waiting on, there's still no votes from, from Longman. Uh, nothing's come in on that yet, which is, which is quite amazing. Uh, we've got a few more uh, comments. It's, Queens, it's, it's Queensland, mate. It's Queensland. You know, it's, it's a bit more laid back. And, and all the cold weathers run away at the moment. It's all got hot again today, so everyone's probably feeling the heat and a bit tired, you know, in their counting. Have they? No, they haven't managed to count any of Mayor yet. And, and of course, the, the other two uh, seats, uh, we've got our, our WA politics expert coming in at 8 o'clock, uh, Matthew Larry, uh, Perth and Fremantle. They're basically considered to be contests between uh, Labor and the Greens. They're both uh, safe uh, Labor seats. Uh, of, of course, Fremantle, uh, Josh Wilson, the incumbent uh, Labor MP, he was knocked out due to dual citizenship. But Perth, on the other hand, was uh, Tim Hammond, uh, uh, who it was only his first term uh, in the parliament. He decided that the, the travel and all the, the commitment was uh, too much on his, on his young family and uh, decided to, to quit. He couldn't even wait until the, the next election to uh, retire. So he just said, look, it's, it's too much for me. And it's interesting that that seat, uh, Perth, the, the previous member, Alana McTiernan, she only lasted one term either. It must be something about inner city Perth Labor MPs. They, they, they can't cope going to the rest of the country. Yeah, it must be flying backwards and forwards across the continent. But that's, uh, that thing designing right now, as you say, that's, um, you know, that's a bit funny because once you're elected as an MP, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to get sacked from the parliament. You could just sort of just hang around and not do much at all and wait for the next election and, and uh, you know, nothing much would happen to you. So why you have to go now, I, I don't exactly know. But um, <laughs> You reckon he should have just bludged? Well, I, I think his electorate would probably not have noticed much difference and mm. uh, you know he could have saved them going to uh, an extra election but um, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that the Liberal Party aren't um, uh, fielding candidates there uh, and it's between the Greens and Labor uh, which brings me to a very uh, important point for people here the areas where the Green Party 
uh, actually has a chance of winning seats. They did it here in Queensland. Uh, they uh, won an inner city seat here. They did the same thing here in Victoria. And the same thing happens on state uh, elections. That it is where there is an enormous concentration of government workers, particularly in uh, education, health and social services, where they can muster enough concentrated votes to actually get a Green member elected. Uh, the statistics for the uh, Victorian seat, uh, I think it was the North Cop where the Greens won, if that's correct, uh, Tim? In Victoria? Yes, the, the state seat yeah. of Northcote. They, they put off a massive upset and so everyone uh, was, yeah. was saying that of uh, Batman uh, with uh, uh, David Feeney as, as of course uh, he uh, said he renounced his citizenship but couldn't find the, the, the paperwork which was uh, hilarious. I used to <laughs> refer to him as uh, forgetful uh, Feeney. Basically, um, yeah, after after that, uh, the the labor power brokers cracked the cracked the shits with him, and uh, they 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 probably didn't think that it was good if he recontest uh, having a, a cis white male uh, as a candidate in inner city Melbourne. Yeah, yeah, and it's in those seats where you get this concentration. I, I remember the reading uh, uh, Nick Cato's um, uh, analysis of the North electorate. I think. I think it was enormous. It was over 40, maybe 48%, uh, something like that, of people in our electorate were government workers. Mm. Uh, so you get a bit of an insight there. When government gets to decide who's going to be government, right, you see who they start picking. And uh, it's very interesting. You go back to the 1999 referendum on the Republic. The only jurisdiction in Australia that voted for it was the ACT which has mm -hmm. got one of the highest concentration of government workers in Australia. So you've got to be very aware out there of what those, you know, government attracts people that like control. It, it attracts people who want to enforce their will on everybody else. But once you get into it, you start getting sort of subsumed into that org mindset as well. And it starts to take over and you start thinking government is the center and the answer to everything. And, uh, so over there in Perth and Fremantle, as you say, like uh, the Liberal Party is just about given up on them, and uh, the Greens think they're in with a chance. Yeah, it's they're they're making inroad or well, they're making inroads in the the inner cities, but uh, yeah, the the Batman result, uh, Labor was able to actually get a swing towards them with uh, Jed Carney, former ACTU president, uh, as the candidate, and the Greens, Alex Patel, it was a sixth uh, shot at this seat, and she was undermined by uh, local Greens uh, members who said she was a bully and a branch stacker. Um, so she was pretty much a dud candidate while Jed Carney was the, the star. Yeah, 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 very interesting. Uh, talking about cis white gendered males, uh, as you mentioned before, I, I was reading in the paper today uh, about uh, Labor's um, ubiquitous backers, the uh, CFMMEUU, uh, whatever they are now, uh, and the amounts of thousands of dollars of fines they're still getting because they're constantly breaking the law. A judge has just found against them again. And I just noticed something. Why is it every time one of these guys is hauled before a court, it's an angry white male. Why isn't there any women or coloured people in the CFMEU being hauled before jail? Why is it always men? You know, they've got a real imbalance in there. Here they are, backing the Labour Party, telling everybody else how prejudiced and racist they are and how they don't have a right, enough of the right sort of people. And yet it's always these white guys leading the CFMEU that are getting hauled off the jail, with maybe one or two exceptions. Mm. Oh, yeah, de definitely the the men in the union movement are probably the, the biggest thugs and have uh, 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 the embodiment of toxic masculinity, which uh, all the feminists always rage about. Yeah, that's right. But you don't see the Labour Party or anybody trying to address that. All they want to do is see uh, more ladies uh, and every other type of uh, apparently persecuted minority in boardrooms and positions of... Uh, real decision-making power, but there's no uh, campaign out there to get more of them in the fishing industry or the underground mining industry or CFMEU officials. 
Yeah, and there was also that case where these workers, they'd been locked out of a mine in a rural Queensland and they were caught on tape yeah. making comments about raping the, the, the mine operator's kids. And uh, Jed Carney, uh, now a uh, federal MP, said that, oh, well, uh, they were provoked into saying that because uh, them getting locked out, it like, caused so much distress that that, that that was apparently okay. Yeah. Well, my answer to that would be, so you're quite happy to excuse disgusting behaviour if you're stressed enough. Uh, will you start applying that same uh, litmus test and standard of judgment to people on the political opposition or anybody else in society for that matter? It's typical of the left. It's one standard for us and another standard for everybody else. And uh, I was uh, thinking about this the other day uh, when the left was desperately hoping that by exposing um, Trump's sexual past and uh, playing the infamous uh, grabbing tape, uh, that this was going to have to tank his um, electoral campaign for president. Uh, but they made a very serious miscalculation. Uh, basically, that was number one, the Labour, the, so the Democrat Party, or same thing almost, the Democrat Party. Uh, they set the standard for excusing sexual behaviour when they put Bill Clinton as their presidential candidate uh, back in the 90s. Uh, they were willing to excuse any type of behaviour uh, that he did. So they set the standard there. And uh, also, when it came to Trump, uh, they made a huge miscalculation because everybody knew what Trump was like. There was no... Uh, hidden things about his life. They know he'd been married three times. They know he cheated on his current wife three times with his next wife. Uh, none of it was a surprise. And uh, they also completely missed the appetite of the electorate to really get Washington blown up and changed. So here they are on the left, constantly trying to throw one set of standards at the opposition, but constantly excusing it in their own ranks, just like you said there from Jed Carney. It was okay to say, we're going to attack and rape your children if you've upset us enough. Oh, let's not forget uh, this week, uh, Emma Husa. I mean, uh, she she's uh, you know consider. Uh, said like she, uh, I'm a domestic uh, violence survivor I experienced it uh, as a uh, child and, and as an adult you know speaking up against uh, abusive relationships and it's turned out she's been the the biggest abuser in the in the parliament of her staff mm. yes I read the other day about uh, one of her staff is when she ran a uh, campaign for a state seat he said he had to be in psychiatric care for a month after working for her yeah, it's it's um it's unbelievable, and I think I I've commented last night that she what a monster. Yeah, that can can you imagine? Can you imagine what it would be like if this was someone on the opposite side of politics? Can you imagine how they would react if, say, for example, um, I don't know, uh, Peter Dutton, or for example, Corey Bernardi, had been credibly accused of forcing staff to pick up after their dog and, you know, abusing them and putting them into a psychiatric care, you know, they would say, oh, this is just typical of white ma uh, toxic masculinity. Well, now we've got uh, Hussar to toxic uh, behaviour, and I don't know what her background is. But, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll excuse it in our guy or our girl, but if it's on the other side, uh, you can bet the uh, media would be jumping on board and running with it for all it was worth. Well, uh, Tony Abbott's uh, chief of staff, uh, Peter Credlin, of course, she was accused of uh, being a bully, and the, the end result was that they ended up uh, Liberal Party room taking out her boss. That that was <laughs> uh, that was how it was uh, handled on the other side. Just to use an example. Yeah, absolutely. And do you remember uh, when um, Tony Abbott? gold the beer, oh, it was evil and it was actually a cause of uh, influencing domestic violence, apparently. But when Bob Hawke skulls the beer, he's a real dude, you know, like uh, it's just, uh, the hypocrisy is disgusting. Oh, yeah, and Hawke was a big womanizer as well. Uh, it's cheated on his wife, uh, had uh, married his biographer, I mean, yeah. Yeah, he was. And they... It's, it's just the hypocrisy of the standards. If, you're gonna, if you want to expose, if you want to hide 
and not cover that and not make that an issue as they did with Borg. They all knew about it, but they didn't make it an issue. Okay, if that's where the game are going to play, apply it evenly to both sides. Right, that's the key. And that's what they don't do. Yeah. We might get back to some results now because uh, things have uh, tightened uh, quite a bit in Braddon. If I, I should refresh the page, page first. So as you can see, Justine Key is still uh, ahead, but it's a, only by uh, 3% 3, 3 there's been a, sl uh, there's actually been a swing to her. She's probably thanking this uh, independent um, Craig Garland uh, quite a lot. I mean, just look, he's, he's still, his percentage has gone down to 17% uh, of the vote. But you see that uh, it's come off the... Well, uh, it's, it's come off the three uh, major parties uh, quite evenly. Oh, it's interesting up there, the, the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party candidate, uh, Brett Neal, he's got uh, 6%. Uh, so that's... Mm. The independent guy you're talking about there, I read that, that he was hoping to get about 10% of yeah. uh, the primary vote that could be divided up. But uh, as you say, just about all of that's going to go to the Labor Party candidate. Uh, one uh, uh, one reason why you should watch uh, this stream rather than say Sky News, for example, because you've got uh, with David Spears, you've got uh, uh, Richard Miles, uh, Christopher Pine, Bruce Hawker, and Fiona Scott. I know that uh, Christopher Pine is not not the favourite of followers of the Unshackled. Nope, not at all. But we should check, uh, I'll bring us back uh, for the moment. Oh, that's the wrong one. Yep, so... We'll see if we've got any results for Longman at the moment, because we're still waiting on... Oh yeah, we've got some uh, results for, for Longman now. If I bring those up there. Uh, Liberal Democrats at the top, uh, a lot was made that whether they get uh, the donkey vote 2%, that's okay. Um, Australia First Party, Jim Salim, much was made of his uh, National Socialist background, uh, less than 1%. DLP, they haven't done too badly, 1.25, but let's skip through all of that. Uh, Matthew Stephen for One Nation, 15%, which is pretty good. They've been polling pretty strongly. Uh, Susan Lamb, she's actually had a swing uh, towards her at the moment of uh, 6%, 6 41% primary vote, and Trevor Ruthenberg, a 10% swing away, uh, down to uh, 28%. So mm -hmm. it's, which means that uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of people have gone away from the LNP to uh, One Nation, it seems. Yeah, polling had primary vote for Labor at 40%. They had LNP at about 36%, which pretty much mirrored uh, the uh, state election. Uh, and as we said earlier on, that uh, when it comes to uh, by-elections, Australians like to kick the government in the balls. And uh, they just uh, winning a seat off the opposition in a by-election is, uh, is almost unheard of in Australia. And I don't think some of the gaps in the election helped. It's really going to come down to where those One Nation preferences end up. And as I said earlier on, um, Labor attacking uh, this tradesman and bringing up all sorts of uh, sort of nebulous dirt and, you know, things that may or may not have been true, unfounded rumours, unproven, verified things. Um, you said earlier on that Malcolm Turnbull said he was never going to get let short and get away with lying again. Uh, but you, you look at politics in general, you can get away legally, apparently, saying things you could never get away with in any other field of life. Uh, if you go out there claiming medical things that can help you and they can't, you can be thrown in prison. Uh, if, you, if you go out claiming all sorts of things, making up stuff like the Medicare campaign, that was never true, there was never anything to it, all they were saying is it's our opinion that they're going to do this, but you, they worded it like it was a fait accompli. Uh, and it, it is a shocking thing in Australia that this can go on and people can get away uh, with this sort of misleading of the uh, of the public. 
basically. Attacking attacking that tradesman for One Nation, uh, you know, I don't know the guy from a bar of soap, but I know that he's a he's a hard working working class guy. He runs his own business. Anybody out there runs your own business, you know that you're often up at midnight doing paperwork, tax forms, doing tenders because you've got to do so much of the work yourself. You sacrifice family time. And this guy's decided he wants to go into politics. His chances of winning weren't very high uh, because he's not in one of the majors. Uh, plus the way his party's being run doesn't help. Uh, but having the Labor Party attacking a working class man, sure, fight on policies, fight on the issues that matter. Uh, getting into a personal attack on him uh, shows you just how far they've departed from their working class roots. Oh, yeah. And uh, Matthew Stephen, it's not like he avoided the, the limelight. Uh, he uh, said, uh, uh, said, tried to clear up, uh, look, a, a lot of that money owed was when uh, I sold the, the, the business, it was nothing to do with me, and that if I owe anyone money, please uh, contact me and I'll, I'll aim to, to pay it. Like he, he wasn't running scared, he didn't run away from press conferences, he actually did a whole bunch of media trying to explain the situation, which if you were guilty, uh, you would just try and hide away. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and, you know, the newspaper had some pretty misleading headlines. I forget the exact wording of them, but, uh, you know, they, they worded it in such a way that it sounded like something terrible had happened. When you actually read the story, uh, yes, of course, but sort of they, they put it in uh, something a bit more reasonable, but the headline was there to give you the impression of what's going on. And this brings me to, like, a very interesting point in Australian politics, and it's, it's who's controlling the narrative. Because when it comes down to it, it's not necessarily going to be won or lost on who's got the better policies. It's, it's an issue of narrative. And uh, this, this was uh, brought out very clearly uh, by Andrew Claven. If you listen to the Andrew Claven show, he's a very good conservative commentator in the US. And he was talking about it in the US context, but it's very applicable over here as well. And it, it, it's, it's controlling the narrative. You know, people are often left with an impression of what somebody is. Uh, an idea, a vague feeling about what a party will do or what they stand for, what they mean. And they want to give you the idea uh, throughout the campaigning that uh, the, the narrative would give you the idea that Turnbull's all for his big wealthy mates and that the Labor Party is the party of lovely compassion and health and education. Because who doesn't want health and education, right? It just sounds so good. You know, if you ask the average person on the street, 99% of them would not be able to tell you the details of those policies, how they'll be implemented, how they'll be costed, where the money is actually going to go, what it's going to be spent on, who's going to get what. You know, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have that. Uh, but it, they would be able to tell you the narrative. They would be able to tell you the, the feeling uh, that they have about what's going on. I'm just checking. We've got uh, some results in for Mayo now, which I'll bring up on the screen. So as we can see there, there's been oh, a big swing to Rebecca Sharkey of nearly 8%. Uh, let's have a look at Liberal Party. The vote is steady at the moment on 30, 38%. Labour is, of, is of course, uh, not standing. The, well, the Greens, their vote hasn't gone gone up much but yeah uh so far the the signs are good for no wait labor is standing what am i i'm getting confused here yeah labor is standing uh we're getting four percent of the vote with uh, eight percent mm. swing away wow what a coincidence there that the swing away from the labor party it's exactly the same as the swing towards rebecca sharkey mm. she obviously seems very popular there <laughs> uh, well, that, well, that's what you notice there when, like, rural seats where there's an independent, the Labor vote is appallingly low. Like, I think when Tony Windsor was the uh, he, yeah, the the member for for New England, I mean, Labor's vote was below ten percent at times. That was appalling. Mm, mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just a bit of a side point on that narrative issue that I was just. Um talking about, and this is something Labor, because they have a lot of media allies, they do very well, is they're very good at controlling that narrative. And the other side of politics is not particularly good at it, uh, but they need to become better at it. 
you mentioned earlier on things us conservative side of politics isn't very good at. And that's one of them. You need to be able to grab a hold of the narrative and try and control it. And uh, that's something, of course, Trump, with his tremendous position of power and influence, is able to do very well. He basically dominates and controls the media cycle. He's able to basically get them... You know, they try and talk about the things they want, but he constantly uh, brings up new things and does different things, and he basically got them running around in circles despite their best attempts to make him look bad. Um, I was listening to a very interesting podcast uh, the other day that I'd recommend to all your listeners uh, called Words and Numbers from the Foundation for Economic Education. And uh, there's a poll that's done throughout the United States every month uh, where they ask people, what is the issue most important to you? Or, you know, what's the most pressing issue in our country? And uh, normally the most important things are things like immigration and stuff like that. Uh, but consistently and continually, gun violence and gun control ranks at 1% or 2%, very low, because normally it doesn't affect just about anybody's life throughout the country. But in March of this year, when you had those school shootings and the media was trying to big up a gun control campaign, uh, that spiked up to about 14%. But after it all died down and stopped, it was all back down to the 1% or 2% again. And uh, this gives you a really good insight into the influence the media has. They, they big up an issue control the narrative. And if you took a poll at that time, you could say, hey, look, look how many people agree with this point of view. Look how many people want this. But it's only because you've been talking about it and shoving it in their face time on end for, uh, for months on end. So uh, people need to be aware who's controlling the narrative, who's trying to distract you from this, that or the other, who's trying to get your attention over there and stop you looking at what's happening over here. Be aware of what's really going on behind the scene and who's trying to sort of manipulate your attention cycle. Yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, uh, we've got some two-party preferred for uh, Longman at the moment. So as you can see, Susan Lamb is uh, ahead at the moment. Uh, she's got a swing uh, to her. It's fascinating, this uh, late surge back to the Labor Party. I don't know what it is. Uh, do you want to have a go at explaining it, Stephen? Uh, I, I can't see the percentages. What are the percentages there, Tim? Uh, so we've got, uh, yeah, 53% two-party preferred uh, to Susan Lamb, uh, 47 to Trevor Trevor Ruthenberg, and, yeah, there's been a 5% swing to, to One Nation, 10% swing away from the LNP, and a 5% swing to the Labour Party. Yeah. How can you explain it other than the fact that Australians like kicking the government of the day in the gut? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think so. And I think the uh, some of the gaps in the campaign didn't help. Um, the medal issue, uh, apparently, uh, really bothered quite a few people, at least enough of a percentage to make them change their vote, uh, which is pretty sad when you think about it, that people could actually start changing their vote because a guy got one letter wrong on an acronym. Mm. Um, if, if that's enough to change your vote, uh, the electorate needs a bit of education, I think. Um, and I think it also comes back down to uh, something that's often come up in circles sort of I've talked in and, and been with that um, Australians really do need to learn how the effect of their preferential vote works uh, and how important that can be. I don't think a lot of Australians actually understand how preferential voting works and how important it is for you to direct it where you want. Um, I think... Uh, I think uh, you know, it's it's incumbent on us probably to sort of make sure that's fully explained to people. I, I, I learned the other day that it was actually, um, um, uh, I think it was Billy Hughes uh, actually introduced preferential voting because conservatives were constantly fielding multiple candidates in elections and the only way they could get them up against the Labor candidate is if they uh, had that preferential uh, system of vote uh, swapping. So... Um, uh, it's quite important for us to realise how that works and start making it work to our advantage. Yeah, I can't help but think that this is a precursor to what would happen in a federal election. I mean, there was talk that if the by-elections went the, the coalition's way, uh, Malcolm Turnbull would rush off to a federal election. I don't think that's going to happen now. He's going to uh, hold on for as long as possible, possibly May next year is the, the latest uh, he, can, he can go. Yeah, May 18th, I think, is the uh, is the last date it could possibly be. 
And uh, yeah, you know, the, the chances of him winning these were, were very low. And uh, um, you know, he'll probably serve out the full term. Uh, I think one of the other issues that people need to be aware of too is the enormous, enormous amounts of money that the left has to fight election campaigns. The unions are cashed up. Uh, there's uh, lobby groups that are very cashed up that can have an enormous influence. And because of their lackluster performance and the fact that they're hardly conservative in any way, shape or form, the Liberal Party is finding it very hard to uh, get the funds to fight an election campaign, which is why the last time, Mac and Turnbull had to pony up, I think, more than a million dollars of his own money. Yeah. Uh, it, it is an enormous issue in electioneering, and it's only going to get more so. And uh, my message out there to anybody of a conservative mindset, if you're a businessman, businesswoman, you've got access to money, if you don't start putting it forward, the Labor Party and the Greens, if they get anywhere near the levers of power again, they're going to make sure you don't have any money. So yeah. get in the fight. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull, uh, giving that money to uh, the Liberal Party, I think that was more an insurance policy for his own uh, job. Uh, see, I'm giving you, I think it was in the end, $2 million, uh, saying, like, look, I've rescued the party financially last federal election. Don't you dare roll me. <laughs> you reckon that's how you, how you get to own a political party? I think, yeah. they were caught, caught, I think they were caught short because the Cormac Foundation who they relied on for a lot of their money isn't handing over any cash at the moment. Well, that's only in the state of Victoria. Um, it's only a Victorian thing, though they've... Um, None uh, of it goes federally, are you sure? Yeah, yeah, it's... it's the, the dispute is with the state Liberal Party. Mm, okay. Uh, but uh, it's it's been somewhat resolved that uh, dispute the uh, Cormac Foundation is deciding to funnel money directly to candidates rather than the admin committee, which they're uh, Victorian Liberal admin committee, which they've been having the the, the dispute with. Mm, I see. But they'll be getting all that uh, money. Uh, Victorian parties that Daniel Andrews passed with his electoral reform was it fifty five million over four years for the uh, for all the parties. Wow. Yeah, from taxpayers. Gee, that's a lot of cash. But it's for the good of democracy because we can't have uh, do donations. Well, this is one of the things about the Australian system that you know I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, for, number one, the, the first pillar in the system is you legally have to vote. Two, you legally have to give your preferences to someone. It almost always guarantees the two major parties get in. So everybody has to vote, and then if you get above that 4%, you all get so many dollars per vote. So it's a guaranteed way of taxpayer money going to political parties. Now, if that's the field you have to pay in as a political party, then so be it. But, gee, I, I'm not a fan of that whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah it's, it's a difficult uh, thing. I mean, I, I still were, would like to see... Uh, political ideas uh, blossom based on their, their popularity, which is, of course, uh, money in politics. I mean, if you believe in a cause, you donate uh, $5 or $50 or, 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 or whatever to it. I mean, uh, that, that's what you do with anything that you're passionate about. You put your money where your mouth is. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the fact that you know, you're not getting a lot of money in shows that... Um, you know, particularly the major parties who have been around for years, do would have no excuse for not being known, uh, shows you you're pretty much disconnected from uh, the people you're claiming to represent. Uh, the Labor Party is, is reliant on a few very big donors like the unions, uh, but union membership is lower than it's ever been uh, in Australia. Um, you know, the Liberal Party is finding it hard to get money from their traditional areas, the uh, business community. In fact, the Labor Party up here is just brought in legislation to make it so that uh, developers can't give money to political parties trying to strangle off uh, a source of funding to their political opponents up here. Um, but you know, a, a really a really good connection to the electorate and to your uh, membership base, to me, is one of the surest ways to um, uh, get your funding and show that you really are still connected to the electorate. 
Yeah, definitely. We might uh, see if we can get some more uh, results up. In Mayo, uh, it's pretty much the result is panning out um, as we expected. If we go mm -hmm. to... Yeah, as we can see there, Rebecca Sharkey, uh, she's got a 3% swing to her, 58.42. If we go down there, Georgina Downer, 2.5% uh, swing against her. Rebecca Sharkey, 9% 9, 9 swing. ALP, oh, that's 5%, pathetic. Mm. Now we might go back to Braddon. It's still... We have a look at the 10% of the two-party preferred vote counted, and just in key is uh, still ahead, uh, 53, 36. I know that Sky before, they had uh, Brett Whiteley in the lead, but uh, they've uh, actually corrected that as well. And if we just go back to uh, Longman. Yep, Susan Lamb, she's got a 4% swing to her. Yeah, it's, well... The, the bookies were right uh, in the end that it's it's the late money to, to labor seems to have been on the money. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the way it was looking. And uh, it was always a tall order to win it off them. Uh, but come come the next federal election, you may well find uh, it's a different story. Mm. Yeah, it's... I'm now turning my attention to the, the federal election. And yeah, like uh, I was saying it before, that if this is repeated in a federal election, Liberals, uh, LNP is gone. Uh, if it were repeated, yes. But uh, general elections are very different than by-elections. Oh, and, but this, uh, is, uh, this is not an ordinary by-election. This Because there was five of them, it was, hmm. it, it, it was seen as a national uh, campaign. Of, in in my opinion, that uh, both the, both the leaders were out on the hustings, Turnbull and Shorten, and they they all wanted to say that it was a, a referendum on our competing visions, which is unusual uh, for a by election. Yeah, that's true. They were treating it different, but I doubt very much the people within the electorates were treating it uh, that way. And I think you'd probably see a different result in a, in a general election, and. Yeah. Uh, I think it'd still be quite close. Mm. I can't help but think, I mean, there, there's always this doubt about Shorten, whether he's likable, whether he'd be able to have the, uh, uh, have the ability to win it. Um, but uh, I go back to you know, when Julie Gillard was Prime Minister and Tony Abbott was the opposition leader. There was always uh, this accusation that Tony Abbott, he wasn't popular enough. He wouldn't have the you know, stamina to get through another election, but he did, even though he wasn't particularly popular. He was able to win a landslide election. And I think Shorten uh, can do the same. And he's probably uh, so glad that the, the Labor Party has the the new Kevin Rudd rules in, which means that uh, if things turn south for him as Prime Minister, he could uh, he could never be rolled. Yeah, yeah, that would be a saving thing for him. Um, I think uh, I think the thing with Tony Abbott, and I think what Tony Abbott proved is, if you are on the conservative side of politics, uh, and Tony, even though the Liberal Party wasn't Tony Abbott himself, certainly was. I think if you uh, you stick to your guns, I think that's a winning position uh, with the Australian electorate. They hate wishy-washiness, and they like it when you stick to what you believe. And even though the media was constantly trying to say how unpopular Tony Abbott was, uh, it turned out he was actually a lot more popular uh, than they tried to give us the impression. And uh, who knows whether that could be replicated by uh, Bush Shorten. But I don't think he, he's not running the same sort of campaign there's no carbon tax to be repealed, which was an enormous issue. Uh, the mining tax was another issue that absolutely hobbled the Labor Party. They had the entire multi-billion dollar mining industry against them. Uh, the carbon tax was, uh, um, Abbott was able to run a very effective campaign against that. So he had several things there working for him, plus he stuck to his conservative guns. Uh, but I think those other two issues really did help them. And the fact that um, in the Labor Party at the time, uh, they rolled 
a first term prime minister and Australians do not like that. You know, there was a lot of skullduggery going on there. And uh, all of those things, I think, uh, helped, um, helped Abbott in uh, his landslide. Yeah, that's... <clears throat> I, I, it's, it's hard to say that uh, because, well, the media narrative is that Tony Abbott was, was so unpopular that he had to be uh, gotten rid of and that uh, they would have been uh, wiped out at the next election and that uh, Turnbull still won even though it was by one seat. Uh, a win's a win. It doesn't matter if you win by one point or 50 points as long as you uh, win. Uh, Turnbull, I, I mean, he's still the preferred uh, Prime Minister. Uh, that, that's the, the main thing that's uh, going for him uh, at the moment. But then again, uh, as I go back to Julie Gillard was, well, at some stage she was popular, but it, uh, in the end it uh, didn't, didn't save her. No, it didn't save her. And, and the fact that, you know, you mentioned earlier on that the Labour Party is going on about this class warfare thing. And, you know, they're making that like the centerpiece of their campaign uh, for the next federal election. Change the rules. Evil, evil, evil. Let's save everybody. Uh, the fact that they've got nothing particularly significant to attack the government over, other than the tax cuts he wants to do, that's really all they've got on them uh, in many ways. Nothing else is really sort of gripping with the electorate. Uh, and, and rather than being a good point for them, well, that, that shows you just how little he's actually done. You know, there's, there's virtually, because he brought down the Labor budget uh, and he's kind of actually implementing a lot of what the Labor Party would want anyway, they don't have a lot to attack him on. So they're forced to retreating into this sort of staking up envy and uh, basically making up stuff. Yeah, we might uh, go back to some of the results just for a quick update. And if we go, so as we can see there, Susan Lamb still well ahead of Trevor Ruthenberg, and that's reflected in the primary votes as well. One Nation still polling strongly at 15% uh, of the vote, which is a 6% a swing to them. So for all those people who say One Nation's dead, uh, oh, this is the beginning of the end for Pauline Hanson Mark II, it's, it's not turning out to be true. I think uh, she and One Nation are going to be hanging around for, well, Pauline's got a six-year term, so she'll be around in the Senate until uh, 2022. Uh, so as long as she's still there and still wants to uh, fight uh, elections, then, yeah, they'll continue to pull results like this. Yeah, that polling, uh, you got the, the result you got there almost mimics exactly what the polling was showing at 14%. Uh, so if that holds out throughout the whole count, uh, that's going to be uh, proven to be quite an accurate number. Um, yeah, look, uh, the future of One Nation, who can say uh, for sure? Um, I, I, I have heard that there is a lot of unrest amongst the members. They really do want to have some influence. They really do want to have a say. And that hasn't been given to them yet. And it's the way, if history is any guy, that's not going to be. Uh, so uh, there could be some rocky times ahead. They've lost two senators. They may well lose the third. Uh, it's because of this treatment that people keep getting within the party. But I think despite all of the fact that the way it's run, you still manage to get so many people voting for them. It shows you how hungry the electorate is for an alternative political party out there. We They're might... just looking for something credible. We might bring in the Unshackled's political editor, Michael Smythe, now. We'll see how this goes. This is always difficult. Uh, he's been uh, volunteering for one of the, the candidates uh, in Longman uh, today. He'll be able to tell us all about it. Hi. Hi. So, because we've got three people here, uh, Stephen, you'll need to move to, I believe, your left, or move yourself left. Yeah. Sorry, give me a second. I've got to turn it up a bit. Uh, the background noise is not too bad there, there, Michael. Oh, oh what's happened to you, Stephen? Oh, it was, it was, I'm here. I'm here. Don't yeah. worry, mate. Don't, I'm not leaving you. 
Yeah. Nice, uh, so, and, oh, it is quite noisy here, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, just bear with me for a second. Oh, at least we're getting some election chatter on this stream. Oh, I can't, I can't hear anything. Hold on. Tony. Tony. Sorry, could you ask him to turn it down maybe a touch? <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so what have I missed so far? Uh, well, it's looking like Labour is going to romp at home in Longman and Braddon, after all. And I think the rest of the uh, contests are just going to be what everyone was predicting. Rebecca Sharkey is going to easily win in Mayo. And um, well, the polls haven't closed in in Perth and Fremantle yet, but I think we know how how that's going to go. That's what it's looking like. Sorry, just give me a second. I'm going to change the microphone over. Okay, that should be a bit better. How does that sound now? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. So it's much better than, um, what's the word? Much better than having the Bluetooth microphone booming over ABC News. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, because I was looking at the results um, before I came online, and what I found was... Oh, we lost you there, Michael. Sound went completely. So I've just got a news alert from The Guardian's called it, saying Justine Key has won uh, Braddon, uh, which is what we've been saying for the past half an hour. I've done so many of these election night live streams now that it's always easy to tell what the result is early on, and then... Oh, shit. That, that noise is really bad. Like, extra bad. No, no, can't hear you now, Michael. No, no, can't hear you. Ah, uh, the joys of live streaming on election night where everyone's everywhere. You can hear me, can't you, Stephen? I can hear you, mate. Yeah, okay. this, is, this is what's going to happen, mate. Uh, Labor's going to keep their seats there. Um, Sharky's going to continue on. She'll just be an independent, and uh, life will life will roll on for the parliamentary leaders. They'll get to the next election and they'll thrash it out uh, over the issues that we've been discussing. And then uh, the Australian electorate's going to be left saying, "Hey, we've still got these same two parties that have been ruling this country for seventy years, still babbling it out, not giving us much choice. Where is our other option?" Uh, because Australia is getting, I think, they, they are desperate for a change. Now, I'll tell you a quote I read uh, from a real estate guy in Longman that the uh, Courier Mail interviewed the other day, doing one of their human interest pieces for the uh, election. And uh, he said, look, you know what? There's a lot of people here. They really like what One Nation say, and uh, they like a lot of their views and, and some of the issues. And then they said, but we just don't think they could be trusted to run things. And I think that really is the key to a third political force in Australia actually breaking through and breaking the political duopoly. You need to be able to prove to the electorate that you can be trusted to run things. And I think that's a key to breaking the power grip that the Labor and Liberal uh, duopoly have over this country. Because right now there ain't much difference between them. Uh, I still think that there's a decent enough difference. I mean... Uh, Liberal, LNP, Coalition, they're always going to be the least uh, worst option. Uh, yes, if, if the least worst option is the best accolade we can give them, uh, uh, yes, I, I, would, I would agree with that. I mean, out of the guard that punches you three times a day as opposed to the guard that punches you once a day, I'll pick the guard that punches you once a day. Hmm. Uh, the guy, uh, if I had to choose between the guy that takes $100 out of my pocket as opposed to the guy that takes $50 out of my pocket, Sure, I'll pick the least worst option. 
Uh, but as far as actual substantial policy governance differences, there's virtually nothing between them. They all still want high immigration. They want the artificial GDP numbers. Uh, they are all sort of still mucking up defence spending and defence priorities. Uh, they're virtually the same on most social issues. Uh, it is a duopoly. It's like the difference between Coles and Woolworths. Yeah, uh, I somewhat disagree with you. We've lost uh, Michael now, so we'll bring back us on the, the two screen there. Uh, Michael is being... Uh, I hope I get a, a name right. Michael uh, Michael's been volunteering with um, the Australian Country Party candidate, uh, Blair Ann Vera, who, if I bring up uh, back up Longman, uh, she has got... Uh, one point nine nine five percent of the vote, which is three hundred and nine votes. So a good uh, start. A good start. Uh, it's still for me like you've got to hit that magical four percent to get the uh, electoral funding, in my opinion. Oh yeah, no, that's that's definitely true. But hey, uh, by the time the counting's finished, uh, uh, maybe maybe they'll have uh, they'll have a few more. Hmm. Oh, you'd hope so. Yeah. So, what else? We'll go back to Mayo. And as we can see, yeah, Rebecca Sharkey easily on track to, to win. Uh, Georgina Danner is, is she's clawed back some of the primary vote, but all the, the preferences are going to Rebecca Sharkey. She'll easily get over the line. That's why the two-party preferred is 58-42 as current. Yeah. Yep. Uh, mm. Oh, we're out of things to talk about already. Yeah, that's pretty good, mate. I think I think we've we've, we've covered most of it. The only thing left now is to get your guy from WA on, and uh, and let's see what's happening over there. Hmm, they're it's still interesting having a, Yeah, it's interesting having a uh, a campaign where the Liberal Party isn't running anybody. They uh, must well, have the, completely given up. Well, the the Liberal Senator Dean Smith, he was tempted to resign from the Senate and run in in Perth just to give the voters an option, but. Uh, I doubt he was ever going to do that, give up a six-year Senate term to probably lose in Perth and be out of Parliament. I don't think he was ever going to do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it, that sounds like me promising I'm going to go and have a fight with Hulk Hogan. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's never, never, never going to happen. Hmm. <laughs> oh, here's a bit of... Um, as You could see me drinking this drink uh, throughout the show, couldn't you? Yes, I could. Uh, well, guess what it came with? It came with a plastic straw. Oh, yeah, yeah, a plastic straw, yeah. They're Evil. The, yeah, Evil I, straw. Yeah, I can't believe that they're the new Great Satan now, plastic straws. I, I, it's, I, the, it's been, there's been a lot of memes the, the, the past few days. Uh, uh, people doing, uh, like, <laughs> uh, drug deals with plastic straws. You got any straws I can have? I read the other day that in Santa Barbara, you know, in California, they're like the center of all lefty nonsense. Um, it is now, you could actually get a jail term for selling straws or giving away straws or something, but it is no longer a legal crime, a crime to knowingly give somebody aid. Mm, yeah, I've, say, I've seen that as well. Uh, I made a comment today that uh, if you get caught with a bag of cocaine in the future, are you actually going to get into more trouble for having the cocaine in a plastic bag or a, plas the, a bag that's made out of plastic? Is that going to be... Or having a straw to snort it with. That could even get oh, you yeah, more what, what are, what are, No, but if you use like... A, well, so some people use bits of like paper. As long as you use paper, then... Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we're going to be having paper, paper straws now. That's what McDonald's is doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, dude. That's... Uh... Oh, so, oh, so they're only getting... Only plastic straws are bad. Uh, paper straws are okay, are they? Yeah. Yeah, paper straws. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Well, right. plastic straws were invented by white men, okay, evil white males. So that's that's probably the real source of the problem, as we've seen. Hmm. Now, what else is going to be contraband in this room? I have got no idea, mate. I I, I marvel at what they can find next to uh, make a big deal about it. Is uh, there you know, is you... no end hmm. to lefty insanity. You're in the the Conocourt book room at the the moment. Uh, any, anything made out of plastic there? Uh, yeah, mate, there is. Um, I'm pretty sure I saw a couple of plastic bags. And I'm Whoa. expecting the uh, uh, the SWAT team to kick in the door any yeah, moment. Yeah, Jack, 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 Jack Boot, uh, Jackie Trad will cut, will come in. <laughs> uh, in there with her uh, commie squad. Oh, mate, she'll have the CFMEU with her, mate. They own her, mm. and uh, yeah, they'll they'll be they'll be kicking in that door. That's for sure. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to give uh, away where the the Connor Corp book room is, but it's like it's it's not far from where <laughs> Jackie Trad lives. Not uh, no, not from where she lives. Where her office is, it's mm. uh, it's very close to her office, and uh, yeah, literally a stone's throw or less. Uh, than that so we uh yeah, they had set up in the middle this was the seat that the greens actually thought they were going to win they had most chance of winning at the last state election ended up being one next door that they ended up winning but they thought they were going to get this one this is where they put most of their effort and money so that shows you how sort of left leaning the electorate is here yeah uh, it's yeah it's every city has its uh in a city, oh, well, I wouldn't say ghetto, but more, uh, I'd say, uh, well, I'd say probably Stasi State. Yeah, well, it's where they all congregate because most of them are government workers, uh, and uh, it's 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 being replicated in most city centres around the country. Mm. Um, the only reason Jackie managed to get back in is because the. Um, uh, LMP preferences float her away because you know who are you going to vote for, communist one or communist two, the red communist or the green communist? Which one do you want? Uh, uh, probably nobody eats the the outside of the watermelon. <laughs> yeah, now I understand down in your way the um, uh, the uh, Andrews government's getting itself into hot water. They're actually under investigation for. Uh, Using taxpayer funds for electioneering, is that right? Yeah, uh, they're, they're actually under police investigation now, uh, six uh, Andrews government uh, ministers, which normally if a politician does, so, uh, so, uh, so I'll give the context, is that uh, uh, I think it was 19 Labour MPs in total uh, mis uh, misused their electorate staff, uh, sent them to marginal electorates to campaign instead of doing uh, electoral work, which uh, there was an independent obnusman in investigation and uh, found that the uh, Labour Party mis uh, misspent uh, $387,000 worth of uh, electorate resources uh, in... Wow! Yeah, and uh, no, what's worse is that to stop, they tried to stop the Ombudsman investigation, uh, which cost $1.5 in legal fees. That's amazing. And so Daniel See, Andrews said, was... yeah, Daniel Andrews said, oh, we paid the $387,000 uh, back, so it should all be sweet. Oh, yeah, yeah. I I'd like to try that line with, the, with, uh, with you know, uh, mil misappropriated funds myself, uh, Oh, look, I'll pay it back. The fact that I broke the law to get it, mm. uh, uh, you just ignore all that. Yeah, yeah, good line. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, uh, he, uh, there's pressure for these six ministers to stand aside now, which, of course, uh, Labour Party never does. I mean, they, they hang on to their, uh, their own uh, forever. Um, but yeah, now that the police are getting involved, normally just politicians, they, they seem to get away with this. They, they pay the money back if they've misspent their travel allowance, they just pay the money back and nothing where if, if you and I do it, I, I mean, just look at how, um, if you're, e even if Centrelink overpays you by mistake, they, you know, you're the criminal. Yeah. So if that's the case. You've got to watch out now for what's the distraction they're going to bring along to try and get the public's attention off it. And what are they going to try and get everybody to focus on now? Because that's what they do. The minute they're really in the legal crosshairs, they look for a distraction. If you get caught with Monica Lewinsky, 
you start bombing Yugoslavia. What can Daniel Andrews do? I mean, he's big on virtue signaling, on social justice issue. Uh, all men were responsible for the rape and murder of Eurydice Dixon. Um, they, they, he doesn't apply the same thing to um, the, the African community, which is uh, interesting. He doesn't say that all Africans are responsible for African uh, crime, but all men are responsible for all men's crime. Oh, he's an absolute hypocrite. But I, I mean, it's like the banks, here they are discovered in the uh, Royal Commission to be uh, charging people for things they've never done, uh, ripping people off. They're really on the being hauled over the cold. But they've got millions of dollars to spend on social justice issues, telling us how awful we are and how we need to be doing what they say. He's been getting rid of one of these big projects, Daniel Andrews, and uh, the Victorian uh, state election will, will probably be our big uh, next live stream unless uh, uh, Emma Husa, uh pulls the pin in the next uh, six months or someone dies. Um, but yeah, it's shaping up to be a very close election because, of course, the, the Liberal Party's had those internal dramas. It should really all be on a platter for them, the, the Liberal Party, oh. with... Uh, obviously, these uh, scandals and the, the African crime uh, issue, uh, the fact that they still won't build the, the East-West link. I mean, there's, there's so many things that they've, they've done wrong. Yeah, you would think a competent opposition, you know, of a major political party, as you say, would be on a platter for them to win. Uh, you should be able to absolutely trounce it in with such a badly administrating government. Uh, who's completely abused their position of power. And not only that, they were responsible for the Safe Schools Program. Uh, you know, you think you should be able to romp it in. What is wrong down there? What is the Liberal Party doing so wrong that it's so line ball? The last polls I saw, it was 50-50. And on top of that, what happened to the Australian Conservatives down there? They were ready to sort of mount a campaign and now they're only backing one candidate in the upper house. What's happening there? Well, they're not contesting any of the, the Super Saturday uh, by-elections. They, they decided after their result in Batman, um, Benelog and South Australia, where they went from two uh, upper house MLCs to zero, that uh, they were going to uh, focus on the, the federal uh, election. It's interesting, the, the Liberal Democrats, they're, they're contesting all five um, uh, by-elections, so they're having a, a red-hot crack. Yeah. But I'm, I'm talking about the fact that the Australian Conservatives have said they're not going to be contesting the next Victorian state election. Yeah, that doesn't make sense, the fact that they've got an MLC, um, because the, the, the way that it works, because there's eight uh, upper house regions in Victoria and they still have group voting tickets. So um, you, you, you have a whole bunch of uh, like other candidates standing in the seven seven regions and then do deals so to, to get your one candidate elected, which would be Rachel Carling Jenkins. So it doesn't doesn't make a whole lot of sense that you'd only run in one seat. one region, I how, should say. How many how many people for the upper house is there in each region that can be elected? Five. So eight times five, there's forty in the upper house. Forty. So they're only gonna back one candidate in one region. Nothing else. Yeah. That's crazy. What what's what's gone wrong there? I mean, they must be livid with that. Mm. Oh, they 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 want to. Oh, I've this is the official line. Focus on the the federal election, but they've got to get. It's a full quota, so they've got to get fourteen. Fourteen percent. Hmm. That's a tall order if you're just running one candidate then in one region. Yeah. I mean, I hope it was misreported that, because otherwise it's a ridiculous strategy. No, it wasn't misreported. I've heard the same thing. But, but Tim, we are missing one of the biggest news stories of the week in all this by-election clamour and cardboard cutouts and people getting acronyms wrong, people forgetting what country they were from and what citizens, countries they're citizens of. We missed one of the biggest news items of the week. And that is that Fairfax is going to be no more. Yes. And it just goes to show, it just goes to show you, if you keep telling your audience they're evil, disgusting, and they need to shut up, they stop buying your product, you make no profit, your shares become worthless, and you get picked up by somebody uh, because all they really want is your digital domain assets because your newspapers are next to worthless. 
Mm. So here's the lesson for everybody out there in the media. Don't tell your audience how awful they are. I, I refer to it as fail facts. Well, <laughs> that... I mean, it's been shedding jobs, shedding its share price, uh, 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 having massive asset write downs for, for nearly a decade uh, now. And of course, the Turnbull government, uh, they uh, changed the cross media ownership laws. They got rid of the, the two out of three rule that uh, you could. You couldn't own, you could only own two out of three assets, television, radio, uh, newspaper, and abolish the, the, the reach rule. So that opened the way for uh, Nine and Fairfax to merge. Yeah, well, look, the media environment in the world today is so vastly different from the media environment where Paul Keating brought those laws in, I believe it was. Yeah. They, it, Trying to regulate media in 2018 is almost like trying to hold water back with a sieve. It, 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 content rules, telling people what they can and can't own in areas, it, it's becoming more and more redundant uh, nowadays. Uh, I've got three boys, they're all adults. Uh, they get almost all their information not from the news on TV. They've got uh, people they watch on the internet and uh, places where they get information from. The place where I work, there's quite a few young guys there in their early 20s. They were saying the other day they don't watch much TV. Uh, it's becoming less and less of an influence. I don't think any of them ever read a newspaper. I'm the only one in the house where I live that reads a newspaper. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's like trying to hold back a flood uh, with a cup. So what, what are they, they going to do? It's like this guy in America, the other is congressman. He wants to ban the use of cryptocurrencies. Since when has the government ever succeeded in banning anything? Uh, people will get it from somewhere. Uh, and it's like trying to control this media thing. It's just not going to work. It doesn't work. The only thing that can control the media is market forces. If you're presenting a good product, if you're reporting fairly, not reporting opinions, but reporting news, stop treating people like mugs, uh, your product will, will thrive and prosper and do all right because people are always interested in news. If you're trying to tell them how awful they are and try and guide their thinking into your social justice warrior idea, like Fairfax used to do all the time, um, eventually market forces will catch you out. The only way that ABC can continue doing it is because they're not accountable to their audience and they get money no matter what. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, if you, if you spend $3 on what, the Age or the Sydney Morning Herald now, I mean, that's such a, a wasted $3. And uh, stuff, uh, go try, uh, paying for an subs uh, online subscription, getting around the paywall, you just there's, there's so much free uh, sources such as the, the Unshackled. I, I can't believe the left still hang on to this idea that, uh, oh, uh, there, there's going to be more media concentration, that only the very rich and powerful are going to control the media. And of course, they, they all have uh, Murdoch derangement syndrome, thinking that Rupert Murdoch, uh, at the what, uh, age of over 80 now, is going to consume all the, the media and turn it into evil, far-right, uh, conservative uh, outlets. I mean, Nine and Fairfax, they're merging because uh, they're, it's, uh, they're coming at this from a position of, of weakness. I mean, they they haven't got their traditional revenue sources such as uh, classifieds, uh, advertise, uh, advertising. I mean, most companies now advertise on, on Facebook and Google. Most people list uh, their uh, classifieds on eBay uh, or uh, job positions on, on Seek. I mean, it makes sense for, for Nine and Fairfax to pull their resources. And if that means uh, a few journalists uh, lose their jobs or maybe, God forbid, have to work a bit harder, then I don't think there's going to be much public sympathy for them. Oh, absolutely not. Uh, I work in a private company. I'm subject to market forces. If my company wasn't performing, uh, I had to close up, I'd be out of a job and I'd have to look somewhere else. You know, stiff pickies. Uh, it's happened to me before in real life. I've been at companies that have closed up. Uh, it, it happens. Uh, trying to sort of pull some sympathy shot like some journalists were on Twitter when it was announced uh, is an absolutely losing game. Um, 
if you think the general public's going to be sad for you because your failing paper that tells everybody how awful they are is having to wind up, you're kidding yourself. It's interesting seeing, uh, I haven't got the sound on, but Fiona Scott on Sky's uh, coverage, she, she, I'm not, I'm surprised she hasn't got the, the popcorn out tonight because she, she could be getting back into, uh, a federal parliament if Emma Husa keeps going the way she is. Mm. So what's the current polling results there, Tim? Have you got them in front of you? Yeah, I will get back to, uh, the, what we're supposed to be talking about, which is their, uh, the by-election, <laughs> Super Saturday by-election, so being up Braddon. As we can see there, it's narrowed a bit, Justine Key uh, is still leading 52-48. That's with 43% of the two-party preferred vote counted. Oh, that's done and dusted. Uh, Craig Garland, uh, his uh, primary vote's gone down to 11%. Brett Whiteley's had a 2% swing against him to 39%, and Justine Key, uh, she's had a 4% swing away from her. She's on 36%. The the Shooters, Fishers, and Farmers Party, Brett Neal, uh, he's on 4.85%, 4, 4 and the Greens, they've had a 2.5% swing against them to just under 4%. Wow, the Greens down to 4%. That's very low. What was it last time? Uh, it was only... Uh, yeah, they were, they were only on, uh, it would have been 6.5% their primary vote last federal election, but up north in Tasmania, that's the sort of conservative area, uh, the, the, or the Greens also did appallingly at the state election, they only got two MPs back there, they're more popular down down south near, near Hobart and uh, that uh, area, so yeah, they don't do well up north. Yeah. So they do well where the government is centred. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Although Tasmania, it's pretty much a state divided. I mean, Hobart, Hobart in the south, Launceston in the north are the two major centres. That's why they can never get a, a football team up there. They can't agree whether it should be in Hobart or Launceston. <laughs> Put it in the middle somewhere. I, I, I have always proposed a two-team solution. <laughs> Two team solution. Yeah, very good. Very good. How's that looking there? Uh, so we're in uh, Mayo, uh, sorry, Longman now, and we can see that uh, Susan Lamb, she's going pretty well. 53.6% um, 53 of the two party preferred vote, Trevor Rosenberg, 46.4% of the vote. And uh, we've got um, how much of the two? We've only got ninety percent of the two party preferred vote counted, um, and we've got yeah. There's been a swing to the Labor Party, swear nearly uh, a swing of three point seven five percent, nine point seven swing percent away from the LNP, and a six point uh, two nine percent uh, swing to One Nation. Mm, mm. You know, the, uh, it is inevitable that uh, Labor will be crowing about it and they'll be saying, well, oh, this is a rounding endorsement of our policies uh, against the evil unfairness of the government and stuff. And it, it really is nothing more or less um, in the main than what normally happens in by-elections. Uh, people kick the government. You know, it wouldn't matter if, if he had doubled everybody's income completely eliminated the debt and fixed cancer, Australians will always say, no, nah, you're not doing a very good job in, in government and they'll give you a kick in a by-election. Yeah, that's... Oh, and also what, what this election proves is that Labor can just continue lying. I mean, just just keep making stuff up and they'll win the next election. They almost won the, 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 the previous election. They're going to be motivated to, to, to keep lying, keep... The, the class warfare rhetoric going. I mean, Shorten's not going to change at all. I mean, Elbow's leadership aspirations are dead now. Yeah, that's um, that, that aspect, that's very troubling that uh, they're allowed to get away with that. And what's also troubling is that Australians let them get away with it. Hmm. Um, yeah, if, if, they, if they knew that that gave them catastrophic election results, 
because people just weren't willing to tolerate you just making stuff up. Uh, they, would soon, they would soon switch off uh, that tactic. Uh, but the fact that, as you say, they keep getting away with it's, um, it's pretty shocking. We might go back to Mayo. And as we can see there, 20% of the two party preferred vote counted. Baker Sharkey, 57.8%. Georgina Downer, 42.2%. And if we have a look there, there's been a 9% primary vote swing to Rebecca Sharkey, 1% swing away from Georgina Downer, 7% uh, swing away from the Labor Party, and Greens have actually gone up 1.5%. Uh, mm. Christian Democratic Party were running in Mayo. They were first on the ballot. Um, they got 1.6%, which is not too bad. Uh, Liberal Democrats, just under 1%, uh, 0.9%. What did the Australian People's Party get? 0.8%. Uh, 0.8%. Yeah, I only just heard about them just the other day. Actually. It's pretty much a populist party. I, I don't have too, too much time for them. Mm. Okay. Mm. So the polls oh, are about to close in uh, South, uh, sorry, uh, Western Australia. So we'll soon get things uh, underway in uh, Perth and Fremantle. Are you, you're about to sign off, are you? Yeah, I think I've covered everything we can cover. We've covered uh, Mongman, which is uh, my home state here and uh, the East Coast. And uh, yeah, have you got Matthew coming on now? Yeah, yeah, he'll be on now, and we'll get uh, Michael uh, back on as well. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know how it was actually out on the campaign trail. There was um, some reports uh, uh, that um, some Labor Party supporters are actually becoming quite aggressive and violent towards people. I'd like to uh, hear from the guys on the ground uh, how things actually uh, turned out on election day. Mm. I think some of that was happening at three polling spaces. Ah, oh, yeah, there's always shenanigans at, at polling places. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, shenanigans is one thing. Being violent towards people is uh, is uh, is another. Mm. It's something I fully expect to see a lot more of in, in politics in Australia. It's what's happened overseas, mm. particularly in the US. The left, if the left don't win, they get violent. Yeah, uh, uh, and sadly true. That's, that's, that's always their mode of operation. If they can't win in the ballot box, they will try and win with the fist. And if the fist doesn't work, they try and win with the bullets. Mm. Uh, that's been the uh, sad case throughout history, I'm afraid. Mm. All right. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for, for coming on this first two hours. It's been great to, to catch up uh, just uh, sure. on, a, on a personal level as well. And I should be up in Brisbane soon for, for Liberty Fest, which is happening again, which was great success last year. I'll be back up there again to, yeah, uh, see, see all of you up at Liberty Works and, yeah, uh, meet up with all of our uh, Brisbane acquaintances too. Fantastic, mate. Look forward to seeing you. Thank okay. you. No worries. Stephen Cable there. Whew. Yeah, it certainly takes a lot out of you uh, doing these uh, live, <laughs> live streams. We've been going for just uh, two hours now. It's just before eight o'clock. We might bring in our Perth uh, expert uh, now, Matthew Larry. I'll just uh, uh, dial him. Does he enter Sky News now? Uh, Sky News. Yeah, I'll just bring you in now. Oh, yeah, I've got a nice, nice backdrop there of all the yep. books. So polls are about to close in, in your neck of the woods. Did you get out to any of the polling places today? Uh, not, not today. Uh, yeah, I'm a bit, uh, a bit far from the polling season in both seats. Hmm. Yeah, I was, at least you didn't have to vote today. 
I know. Uh, I, I mean, Swan. So next door to Earth. Well, who's the the MP there at the moment, Swan? Save Vines. Oh yeah, liberal, liberal MP. Yeah. Do you reckon there's going to be, I mean, there's a lot of talk that um, next federal election, WA will uh, turn red once again. What, uh, what's, what do you get? What's the feeling you get on the ground? Well, in Swan, we got Cain Beasley's daughter, Wana in Swan. Cain Beasley, Hannah Beasley. So, how okay. can... I reckon Hannah B.C. could remain Swan very easily. Uh, wasn't it held by um, Kim Beasley at one point? Yeah, it's from 1980 to 1996. Then he switched uh, to Brand in that election, yes. which was uh, a good idea because uh, Labour lost that and they haven't gained it since. Uh, they gained it one time because Don Mando held it for one term from 1996 to 1998. Then he switched over to Canning and got elected in 2001. So as a uh, young Liberal, what have you made of the results so far? Uh, Labour looks set to retain uh, Braddon and Longman, despite uh, all the, the hype in the, the media. And uh, there's also, oh, well, we, we knew that Rebecca Sharkey was going to, to win in uh, South Australia. It was just a matter of what was the margin. Yeah, I think he's speedy. I think Longman could be uh, very close because there's two. I think Longman would be closer than Braden. And with uh, Rebecca Saki, as a result of DNA Dana, it's fourth generation South Australian uh, dynasty, so I think the public are sick of the dynasties. Mm. Yeah, most likely. And I was saying this before, Georgina Downer, she's not that impressive. If she was quite charismatic, then uh, the result may be different. Yeah, I think, yeah. See, it seems very nice, but see, it's sort of one in a Victorian seat. Mm. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> So it's just after eight o'clock now. So the polls have have closed. There, Liberal Party decided not to contest Perth or Fremantle. What did you make of that decision? Do they are they right to save money, or should they have given the voters of those electorates a choice? Sooner you know, of uh, gone the sooner of one in both seats to get the money because it's two dollars seventy cents for every vote you get. And based on the last election results, the Liberal Party has lost $190,000 based on not running on the by election. Hmm. Basically, you're running both seats. Hmm. One low, one low key campaign. And have the uh, LA Thursday in Perth one, the candidate as they warm up for 2019. Perth is becoming more liberal and we've still Perth in the most prominent liberal, independent liberal running is Ian Britzer. Ian Britzer was a two-term member for Morley and Morley was in the Perth, is in the north of Perth, in the city of Perth. So, Ian Bixer has got the big, biggest name, biggest name of all the Liberals running in, all the, all the independent Liberals running in the city of Perth. Yeah, who are the two, two independents in Perth? I'll bring it up on the, on the screen. So excuse all the zeros. So, 
What were their names again? Phil Collins. Yep. Ian Blitzer. And the sign of Billy Graham, uh, Phil Graham. Sorry, which? Uh, Jim Graydon. Yeah, Jim Graydon, yep. Yeah, and of course the Liberal Democrats are running uh, Wesley Dupress. Yeah, see, so I'm uh, Edith Cowan. So we may have a look at um, if there's been any update in Susan Lamb in still very comfortable position with 25.5% five percent of two party preferred vote counted uh susan lamb yeah obviously well ahead 55 45 and we can see on the primary vote uh it's, it's obviously still very good for susan lamb 42 percent uh of the primary vote trevor ruthenberg 25 percent that's one Nation, uh, Matthew Stephen, the fact that he's only 10% behind the LNP, that's got to really scare them. So we might go to Braddon, where 62% of the two party preferred votes counted, and it's obvious there, Justin Key, 52%, Brett Whiteley, 48%, she's going to get over the line there. Liberal Party ahead 38-36 on the primary vote, but the the votes from Craig Garland, the the independent, they're they're all going to uh, the Labor Party. Add in the the Greens there, and they're just in keys over the line. And the Australians just called Braddon and Longman for Labor. Uh, which is uh, what we've been saying on this stream for um, the, the, the past couple of hours since the, the trend uh, became, became known. It's probably not going to be, uh, <clears throat> be for another half hour when we get to see uh, results in, in Perth and Fremantle, but I might... Fremantle, it's it's a very far left area of uh, Perth. Why why is Fremantle like it's the the port area of uh, Perth? Why has it become such a a left left wing haven? Yeah, the seat of uh, Fremantle uh, is a very uh, working class area, and it kind of like. What is going on in uh, Melbourne right now? The city of Melbourne and Victoria. Yeah, is it uh, like are they? Is it like the other states where it's these you know like inner city hipsters? They've all moved into the area. Or is there sort of like a a suburb where they all congregate? So is that that sort of what Fremantle's like, or is it? Yes. Yeah, I mean it's uh, very much like that now. The Greens won the state seat of Fremantle in the 2009 by-election after the retirement of Jean McGreensy from uh, it was the former attorney general of Western Australia and the Greens won in Fremantle state seat so with the absence of little party in running the Liberal Party, the Green Party might could do to could be a poor upset in Fremantle. We might bring in about try and bring back in the Unshackled's political editor Michael Smythe. So we'll just see if we can get him back here. There's going to be Skype music going to interrupt the the live stream. This is <coughs> Michael. Are you there? Oh no, we're still dialing him. Are you there? We can't hear you, Michael. Uh, Matthew, you'll have to move um, to your left. 
Yeah, yeah, that's it. <coughs> uh, sorry, Michael, we can't hear you. So we're still waiting on the first results to, to come in for Perth and, and Fremantle. Be interesting to see what the, the analysis is. I might just check the mainstream media outlets before you bring up, say, what the Australian's saying. Their headline is One Nation Taking Votes from the Libs. Oh. Michael. Hello. Hello. Sorry. Hello. I'm going to have to probably put it on um, audio only if that's all right. Yeah, yeah, that, that's okay. Um, probably works better for our graphics now because it's really hard to fit three people in the screen. <laughs> Indeed it is. Yeah, we've got uh, uh, Matthew Larry with us uh, as well, giving us our voice for the from the West. Oh, that's good to hear. Hello again, Matt. Hi, Mike, how are you? How... Yeah, good, thanks. A little bit dis disheartened by the results in Longman, but, you know, all things considered, I think we've done okay. Yeah, we've... Uh... With you know, you're running for the country party, like a uh, helping country party. Yes, I was helping out Blair Verrier of the country party. Yeah. Um, he, as anyone who read the analysis that I wrote um, yesterday would understand, she ran for uh, the seat of Palmerstone in 2015 under the Palmer United banner. Ooh. And she. And she got 7.3% of the primary vote, which was impressive for her first candidacy. Looking at the seats of Longman, and given the fact that it's about four times the size of a state seat in Queensland, her results so far have been uh, commensurate with that earlier result. The result, I have to point out here, that the result for Blair would have been a lot higher had the Democratic Labor Party not decided to run a candidate because most of the people who voted for the DLP would have most likely voted for Blair. So in the end, they ended up splitting the vote and it actually ended up doing a lot more um, harm than good in terms of the... Um, electoral representation. Uh, but that that's that's what, like, they're an independent party. What, what are they called now? Labour DLP, um, which is interesting. Uh, I mean, an independent minor party is going to do whatever it wants. I mean, alliances between minor and micro parties, they're, they're, they're never going to amount to anything. You mean, you, mean, you mean agreements to work together? Yeah, the yes. thing is, it, yeah, the thing is, though, you know, the DLP actually gave the country party an undertaking that they were not going to run a candidate. And then just before the the um, the nominations closed, they decided, oh, we're going to put someone in there. Great. Great way to split the vote. As it turns out, though, the country party has won more seats, uh, sorry, not more seats, more votes than the DLP has. So the DLP has to have a good, long, hard look at itself and basically just give up, quite frankly. I mean, they could have run in Perth, where there was no Liberal-endorsed candidate running, or in Fremantle, and they would have gotten a, not only a much better vote, but they also would have gotten enough money to fund their next three or four campaigns. But no, they decided for what what I will actually say publicly is a matter, a matter of sheer spite being the reason why they chose to run in Longman, but in no other by-election. Even though they say it was just a trial with the whole Labor DLP thing, it wasn't just that. That's just the pretext. The real reason was just as a way to undermine a new minor party coming up. And that's what, and that's the problem. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Egos are what holds back parties, minor parties from ever becoming major parties. 
Well, I think that's the way that it's always always going to be. Like it's it's never like there's been a lot of Stephen Cable was on before talking about you know it's the the two party duopoly, but they like I, I know that uh, people like us rage uh, against them, but they're they're always going to be they're always going to be still standing at the the end of the day. That's where sort of the the star candidates go most of the time. Mm. Well, it makes sense. It makes sense from from a p perspective of you know, do you want to get into parliament? Yes. Then, if so, how do you do it? Do you choose the Labor Party vehicle or the Liberal Party vehicle? That makes sense. In fact, you know, I've had a lot of people saying to me, "Oh, if you want to get anything done, you've got to join the Labor Party or the Liberal Party." But at the end of the day, both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party are so professionalized that trying to change it from within is not practical anymore. Still no votes uh, yet from uh, Perth or Fremantle at the moment. Mm. Uh, it's only 15 minutes in. Luckily, uh, uh, P uh, Perth and Fremantle are only on a two-hour uh, delay. It's not daylight savings. I remember um, the first election night live stream the Unshackled did was the, the Western Australian state election, and the polls didn't close until 9 p.m. Uh, that... Um, well, on the on the east coast and so i think we're up until uh past 1 a.m doing the live stream for because we we're waiting for the upper house <laughs> results to, yeah. to come in as well yeah i'm, I'm used to say like saving it's been so have it in the way it's going to i know um you're opposed to um oh you're in sorry in favor of daylight savings matthew but it seems yes. to be for some reason even though we've had it in sydney melbourne oh New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia for forever, but apparently it's going to be uh, Western Australia is going to go down the toilet if you uh, have daylight savings. Yeah, it's a very silly uh, argument because our trading partners are made trading partners are Japan and China, so it would be great to have that in both in half in half distances are uh, so half time zones. So half the year we in the have same time as China, but half well, half Japan. Yes. Very same how we not how we don't have it. Mm. Well in in Queensland they had the issue of they had a plebiscite that they said no that they didn't want it. So they've been discussions ever since then about bringing it back they've never been considered very favorably by by the majority of queenslanders so it's i'm in two minds about daylight saving on the one hand it would make trading easier on the other hand we don't like change so what do you do <laughs> Uh, it's, I, I love daylight savings. I love it. Oh, I love summer. So I love it when it gets dark at nine o'clock at night. Should still be daylight now, I, in my opinion. Ah, oh, have we still got you there, Michael? I think we might have lost him. Oh no, there you are. Michael, are you there? No, we've completely lost him now. He'll come back when he's uh, when he's ready. So. Uh, they're showing the the labor um, celebrations in Longman. They're all looking pretty excited there. But yeah, everyone's called Breton and Longman for the Labor Party 
So that's pretty much the the same parliament's going to be looking the same, which means out of all these uh, by-elections caused by uh, dual citizenship, uh, the uh, the sitting member uh, has been returned, or except in, in Batman, where the, the sitting member wasn't recontesting. So the incumbent party has, or has won the subsequent by-election. Even Barnaby Joyce, uh, well, that was before we knew uh, all that we know about him now. You're still with us, Matthew? I am. Hmm. Uh, do you have any um, analysis on the results so far? I haven't got uh, any results yet. Not for in Perth. State. Yes. Not in your in, state, in, no. no. Uh, I can double check again. Um, if I go official results. No, still nothing. For uh, East Perth Pool will be very interesting of a housing commission because that seat went to the Liberal Party in the state election. Mm. So uh, it'll be interesting to see around East Perth area to see what they'll do. It went to the Liberals, did you say? Yes, I uh, remember is in the state election. It's interesting that in some city areas, the Liberals can do reasonably well. Uh, for example, the, the Liberals hold the federal seat of Brisbane, which was, would surprise a lot of people. Yes, Perth and Brisbane are very much more uh, conservative than Sydney and Melbourne. And with a bit of uh, because the leftists are lefties and the screeners seem to be contracting around in Fremantle. So, yeah, so I do a big hit what's on the eye on the Greens because they could do on the premises to so get, might get elected on premises to the Green Party because they won the state seat of Fremantle in 2009. And that could win it again, again, in by-election because it was a Charles Nine by-election. That the Greens won in Fremantle, the state seat of Fremantle. Mm. Yeah, it's um, and also Adelaide, the federal seat of Adelaide, that was held by the Liberals for a number of years, but with the South Australia losing a seat. Uh, uh, Adelaide, or the seat of Adelaide remains, but it's become safer for the Labour Party. Yes, Adelaide will be a, it's, Adelaide is very much a mixed bag, like Brisbane or Perth, because the Liberal Party held the state seat of Perth, and with the demographics obtaining Perth, Perth is becoming more of a Liberal seat now. I, I, I would not be surprised in the next, within the next two elections, Perth will be, uh, will, will be a Liberal seat federally. Hmm. Still have got no results yet for, um... No, nothing for Perth and Fremantle at the moment. We should see how far the voting's come. The... As we can see there, um, in Braddon, 67% of the, the two-party preferred vote is counted, and Justin Keyes still holds a comfortable lead. There's been a slight swing uh, 0.06% away from her, but that's uh, marginal. Uh, as we can see, uh, there's been a uh, swing away from the Liberal Brett Whiteley of 2.2%. Uh, um, also one away from Justin Key of 4%. 
most of that's gone to the independent uh, Craig Garland and also the uh, Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party, Brett Neal, he's got 4.85%. And uh, Donna Gibbons, another independent, she's done all right. She's got 2.4% of the vote. The Liberal Democrats got 1.2% of the vote. Greens did very poorly, 3.96% of the vote. We'll just go back to Longman. As we can see, Susan Lamb, well, she's way ahead, but still 37.9% of the two-party preferred vote counted. Liberal Democrats, 2% uh, primary vote there. DLP, Labor, 1.3%. Independent Jackie Perkins, 2.7%. Uh, Matthew Stephen, he's gone under 15% now at 14.8%. Susan Lamb, 42%. That's a really strong primary vote. Um, and Trevor Ruthenberg, uh, just 26% with a 10% swing away from him. That's appalling. Uh, Blair Vera, uh, Michael's candidate for the Australian Country Party, 1.7%. And Gavin uh, Berenes for the Greens, 6.1%. Uh, uh, and let's go... Uh, Mayo, we'll just have a brief recap of that. So, Rebecca Sharkey, 58, 42%. That's with 50% of the two party preferred uh, vote counted. And as we can see, Rebecca Sharkey has had a 9% swing towards her, nearly 45% primary. Georgina Downer, 35%, 35.8% primary, a swing away, 1.5%. Labor Party is has had a 7.3% swing away from them. They're just on 6%. And <clears throat> other parties that have done okay, 1.6% uh, for the Christian Democrats. Uh, Liberal Democrats just under 1%. And we've got the Greens who've had a 1.5% swing towards them. Uh, of uh, They're just under 10%. So, see if there's any... Still haven't got any from Perth and Fremantle. It's nearly 8.30 here in on the East Coast, which means it's 6.30 p.m. there in Perth. We should be getting some results in shortly, I would imagine. So uh, still no one has uh, been prepared to, to make a statement because we've got the, the TV stations on in the background. We've just got uh, Georgina Downer's Georgina about to make Downer's a statement. We'll I was going to make such a good you. point. <laughs> we'll come back to it. Friends of Mayo, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's been a, a very long campaign. It's been a very hard campaign, and in times it's been a very cold campaign. But the one thing that you can be absolutely assured has been consistent right the way through the campaign, and that has been the commitment and dedication of your candidate, Georgina Downer. So this is obviously going to be a concession speech. <laughs> Georgina, Georgina has been an inspiration to us all. She's been an inspiration to her volunteers, the people that have been out door knocking with her, the people who've been letterboxing, the people on pre-call and all of you who've been out today on the polling booths. She has been an inspiration. She's been an inspiration to my colleagues from Canberra. So many of them have Trump come over here, not because they had to, but because they wanted to. And I acknowledge tonight, all the way from Melbourne, James Patterson and his team that have been on the polling booth all day. That is a sign of the commitment that you generate, the people that want to work for you. Can I just also shout out to Georgina's family? We all of us who are in politics understand how difficult and demanding a job it is but the people that make us keep going, the people that support us, and I see a very proud couple of parents in Alexander and Nikki standing here, 
But can I, um, can I actually acknowledge Will, and particular um, Henry and Margot. They're perhaps a little bit young to go on polling booths <laughs> as yet, but I can assure you, my 16-year-old had to be on a polling booth all day today. <laughs> Um, so just I don't know who this lady speaking is at the Look, moment who is building her up. It has been an absolute honour for me to have worked with Georgina. It's an honour for the, for the electorate of Mayo to have somebody of this calibre representing or wanting to represent them. I have no doubt that one day Georgina Downer will be the member for Mayo. Uh, don't count on it. To all of you, you, you're already rostered on to polling booths come the main election. Margie Westmore's got your name and number, and you're expected to be there. But look, it is a great honour. It's a great privilege. Um, I have enjoyed immensely working with Georgina. She is an extraordinary candidate. We are ever so proud for the fact that you have invested so much in Mayo. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you your candidate, Georgina Downer. Let's see what she's got to say. Ladies and gentlemen, um, supporters, family, friends, uh, I have just spoken to Rebecca Sharkey and uh, I've congratulated her on being re-elected as the member for Mayo. Uh, she put up uh, an extremely good fight to retain the seat and I, I do applaud her because um, ultimately this was a by-election um, that was about the people of Mayo. and absolutely respect the decision they've made today. Uh, I would like to thank you all for being here tonight, but all the efforts you've put in over the last 10 and a half weeks. A by-election um, is always tough for a government and being the government's candidate, we always knew that it would be a particularly challenging campaign, especially up against an incumbent in this unique set of circumstances with the Section 44 citizenship crisis. Uh, but I think we did an extremely good job, guys. I'm really proud of you all. Uh, thank you. There is a huge number of people who helped me out in this campaign, absolutely huge number. We had hundreds and hundreds of volunteers out today and I, I'm not going to be able to list you all, but I would like to just pick out a few people. Um, firstly, Lynn Nitschke, the FEC president for Mayo. An absolute stalwart of the Liberal Party here in Mayo. and. Uh, without whom I, I wouldn't be here. And I really do thank you so much, Lynn, for all the support that you and John have provided me, not just over the last 10 and a half weeks, but, but over the last quite, quite a while, um, inspiring me to, to take up this challenge. So thank you to you both. <laughs> to the indomitable Margie Westmore, wherever you are, you are small. Liberal Party in Mayo without you. Um, you are um, an absolute um, just hero to me. I could not have done this without you. Um, the amount of corralling of volunteers and uh, work you did day in, day out, in the middle of winter, sick, tired, you kept at it and with pollen at your side, packing up pre-poll booths uh, and setting them up every single day, three weeks of pre-poll. Um, we, my, my whole family owes you a huge debt of gratitude and um, I, I'm looking forward to the next chapter, Mark. <laughs> so thank you. To the, to the state MPs in, within Mayo, and I see Dan Cregan over there, and there was um, Josh Teague, 
David Basham, Stefan Canole, um, Adrian Pedrick, I'm going to forget one, it's going to be embarrassing, um, John Garner, thank you, uh, and, and Vicky Chapman, who's um, the paired state MP for Mawson. Um, you, you guys were um, such a fantastic support, and even yesterday morning at 7am at the Mount Barker Park and Ride Dam, in the um, in the cold, talking to commuters, I um, I really couldn't have done this without you, and and the support you showed me in the lead up to the pre-selection as well um, was was really invaluable. So thank you to you all. Um, to the to the to the young liberals, uh, the young liberals, um, and led by by Nick Barrack. I haven't seen him here tonight, but. Um, the Clemo family as well, there are, um, and Bradley Orr. You, you, you are there with me on weekends at supermarkets, always there in fantastic numbers. And the Liberal Party does not operate without the Young Liberal Movement. It is an incredibly important part of the Liberal Party and, and what makes us such a successful party. Um, and, I, and I really do appreciate all the support that you, you always showed me. Um, over, over a very, very long campaign. And I know it was in the middle of uni exams, so it was particularly challenging uh, for many of you to get out, but you still did it, and I really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you to you all. Uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the federal um, Liberal parliamentary team, um, and of course, Anne Rustin is the paired senator for Mayo, um, but there were so many of you who came out and I, I really did appreciate all the guidance and support you provided me throughout this campaign. Um, it was, uh, the, the confidence you showed in me was, um, was really very humbling. We're, uh, we're over to Rebecca Sharkey Thank you, claiming victory. Of you, uh, over the top of Georgina the last 78 days. It has been a marathon of a campaign. A bit ungracious, we interrupting her, her opponent's concession power. speech. Thank you. Tonight we have shown that you don't need huge wads of money. You don't need a huge political machine. What you need are people who are passionate, people who care, and that is every single one of us in this room and all of the other supporters that couldn't get here tonight. We will be having barbecues north, south and on Kangaroo Island, so there will be plenty of opportunity for us to get together. I was crushed the day I resigned, but, but Today is really sweet and, and I could not do this without you. And there's some other people that I'd, I'd particularly like to thank. I, I can't thank every volunteer name by name, but you know that, that I am indebted to you. I'd like to thank my, my husband. He is, he is somewhere here. He's, a, he's the, uh, the wind beneath my wings. Nathan, you are here. Here he is. My children, Edwin, William, Evelyn, they're here tonight. My parents, Tina and George, they're somewhere in there. And Dad, thank you for the magna. I can now. <laughs> Dad, I accidentally put 18,000 kilometres on your magna. I'm really sorry. But, uh, but uh, I promise I'll get it serviced. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank all of my staff because uh, we haven't been allowed back in the office. Um, the day I resigned, I had to hand back the keys to the car, I had to hand back the keys to the office, and I had to say goodbye um, to, to my staff. And uh, I've got to make sure I get everybody's names. Um, Daniel, uh, Danielle, uh, Megan, Gemma, Hayley, Mitch, uh, th they were the ones uh, that were in our office, uh, and we've got uh, Kelly, who's here tonight, she's on maternity leave. Uh, Kelly, wave somewhere. And then, um, then there were three staff who lost their jobs when I resigned. And they were Michael and Sam and Genevieve. And together, the three of us, uh, well, with me, that makes four, um, we've been squished 
in a tiny, tiny room in the back of my fabulous accountant, Adam Ocean, on 58 Adelaide Road. Bit of a club for Adam. He has put up with us for 78 days. And Adam, I love you. Thank you so much. Um, I've got some of my, my parliamentary colleagues here. Um, Scott Poshkimore, we've got to get this woman back into the Senate. Next election. Rex Patrick is here. Rex, uh, Rex, I couldn't have done it without you either. Um, Sterling is not here tonight, um, but um, Sterling has been helping me behind the scenes every day. I want to thank one more person who's no longer in politics, but who gave me a chance back in 2016, who, who is not interested in politics anymore because he gave 20 years of his life to South Australia. But he's a dear friend of mine, and I'd like us to all thank Nick Xenophon. All right. Well, she's a survivor. Jackie, she claimed. All right. So that was the concession speech from Georgina Downer and the victory speech from Rebecca Sharkey. And it's she's been quite lucky, Rebecca Sharkey, to be elected in the first place for the member as the member for mayor, because of course she defeated Jamie Briggs in uh, 2016, who uh, of course had had a horror uh, past year. Uh, he. Um, uh, at uh, Tony, uh, when Tony Abbott lost the the prime ministership, uh, he uh, injured his uh, leg uh, trying to crash tackle uh, Tony Abbott at his uh, 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 booze up uh, party that night. He lost the the leadership and was rolled into the party room in a, a wheelchair the the next day. And then he had to resign his uh, junior ministry because he behaved inappropriately towards a female staffer. Uh, in uh, Hong Kong, and then he sent uh, information uh, about her to uh, other uh, political uh, people. And there's, no, we can't bring it on now. Um, Matthew Stephen is speaking on Sky News, but I don't have access to, to that. So, um, well, he's speaking directly with Sky News. It's not a press conference, so we can't, can't show that. Um, but yeah, Rebecca Sharkey, she was obviously lucky that she was also against a flying candidate for, from interstate. She's been very fortunate. You, you get a bit, yeah, when she says that, oh, I lost everything when I got thrown out. You don't sort of like it when politicians are, are too comfortable. This Justine Key here. We're confident now, Ellen. Uh, we think there's about four and a half thousand outstanding votes. Our lead's about three thousand. We don't think Brett Wiley can now make this up. What are you putting this success down to? Uh, it's been a very local campaign. Justine's been working really hard on the ground. No, the that's. The issue's been health, and we've seen the Liberal Party's cuts to health. Uh, we've seen Brett Wiley support a GP. That's not uh, Justine Key. That's what's her, what's her name again? Julie Collins, their federal member for Franklin. So she's just being interviewed by ABC News 24. So Matthew Stephen, the Sky Graphics, says, I'm like a lost kid in the candy store. You can't get the smile off my face. Well, he's done well with 15, um, or around about 15% of the primary vote after pretty sustained scrutiny on his, pretty much his character and reputation. But uh, he's, he's, he's brought one nation back after... Uh, they lost a uh, senator in Brian Burston, and even when Pauline Hanson was overseas. Uh, we should check if there's any results now from uh, Perth and Adelaide. I assume there would be now. If I can bring those up. Oh, yeah, we've got some results from... We'll bring up Fremantle uh, first. I know this is what you've been waiting for, Matthew. Yes. Yeah, so there we can see Australian Christians, 7%, 7.5% of the vote. That's pretty impressive. 7.5 for Australian yeah. Christians. Well, we've got absence of the Little Party. Yeah, I think uh, a little bit... 
lots of people uh, have performance. Uh, I have seen some people saying or saying questions or Liberal Democrats. Yeah, Liberal Democrats. Yeah. Uh, I've just seen their figure: fifteen point six percent of the vote for their candidate, John Gray, which is wow. They'll <laughs> they'll they'll um, be getting some good electoral funding from that. And an independent, Jason Spanbrook, he's got uh, seven uh, percent of the of the primary vote, and the Greens only eleven point five percent. So Liberal Democrats have beat the Greens. Wow, <laughs> and I know, uh, trying to figure out with, uh, with uh, who were going to swing prison from its uh, liberal democrats of anyone else. Trying who to did? find if it's, I'm trying, trying to find the liberal, uh, if what if a uh, swing prison's from its uh, liberal democrats. Mm. I'm trying to find out if I did. Yeah, that'll be um, that'll be interesting because they're coming. Yeah, they're coming second at the moment, the Liberal Democrats. So they could actually end up on the the two party preferred uh, against Labor, which would be that would be very interesting. Let's have a look for Perth now. So Perth, uh, Julie Matheson, she's got a good donkey vote at uh, six point three seven. Uh, percent. Uh, unfortunately, Liberal Democrats Wesley Deprez hasn't been able to replicate party success in Fremantle. Only 2.7 percent of the votes so far. And Greens are actually 31 percent of the primary vote in Perth, and the Australian Labor Party only at 30 percent. Paul Collins, Independent, he's got 17 percent uh, of the vote. So, but probably on preferences, the uh, Labor Party will get over the line. But that's pretty impressive for the Greens in um, in Perth. Thirty-one percent primary vote uh, is very good for Greens in Perth. So yeah. Um, the first, yeah, obviously Perth. It's going to be interesting how the, the two party preferred vote uh, comes up, um, but it's also going to be interesting in Fremantle where the oh wait, it's actually there now. Um, no, they're still two party preferred. They have, they're only calculating at between um, Labor and the Greens at this stage. I doubt that the Christian Democrats would be preferencing the Greens over uh, the uh, the Liberal Democrats. So you would think that would we don't know. Do you know anything about that independent Jason Spanbrook? I haven't. Uh, I don't know how uh, the independent very well. Reason what? Him, but it's, uh, going got going got five. Uh, I don't know, four votes in Britza. So I thought in Britza would have been a big uh, independent liberal. But Phil Collins, like Paul Collins, as I say, uh, got only 17% right now. Uh, Perth, there's no two party preferred vote yet, so that'll be really interesting. We might as well check while we're at it. Uh, let's see. Still not too much of a two-party preferred vote counted in Longman, but as we can see there, um, Susan Lamb, well, 55-45 ahead. And as we can see, that's most likely because a lot of people voted early in Longman. It had the one of the highest... Um, pre-polling out of all the the Super Saturday by-elections. I do not understand why they still don't don't count pre-poll until Monday even even though those votes are cast early because what they do in New Zealand because I covered the New Zealand election is the pre-poll they count that on election day and so when the polls close at 7 p.m. New Zealand time uh, they're able to just put the release the pre-poll results instantly 
and then they just start counting the ones cast on the day. It's a much better system. Yeah, it's the AEC sort of uh, uh, count the votes, uh, get on more staff to count votes. Mm. If and they're very salt, son. That way, much more easier. Yeah, if New Zealand can do it, then I think the AEC uh, can do it. But did you know that in New Zealand that it's actually against the law to hand out how to vote cards? They don't have how to vote card people. Completely different in that regard. So you just turn up to the polling. I sometimes wonder why the major parties, they aren't tempted to just introduce that law so they can save all that money on how to vote cards. And uh, oh, a lot of them aren't uh, volunteers anymore. They're paid people. So why don't they just uh, get together and like make it, make handing outside the polling place illegal, and then that's it? Yeah, because uh, most people have the how to vote cards on their mobiles now. Because I did um hand out how to vote cards for the state and for the state elections and federal elections, and some people had to say they have on their mobile now, so. If I have on mobile, then really don't see the need to be uh, hand out held vote cards. Then, and if they say my own paper, they'll say. So I have no idea why. I know which the Greens would be in favour of that or not. Yeah, to consider how much paper is wasted. Mm. Oh, uh, no one's... Oh, we've only got one person watching at the moment, so I think we'll wrap this up at uh, 9 o'clock, um, because, yeah, it's... Uh, the, the results are known in Longman, Braddon, and also in... 9 p- in Mayo. 9 p.m. Uh, East Coast time. Okay. Yeah. So, and... So we'll, we'll just in the... In the last five minutes, see, see where we haven't got any two party preferred vote yet for the the Greens and the Australian uh, Labor Party, but um, the the Victory Party is happening at uh, in Longman for for Susan Lamb. But um, uh, thank you, Matthew, for for making uh, your. Um, internet debut with the the unshackled and offering the the western australians perspective yeah thanks i'll be back back at, i'll be back again soon and thank you to all those people who uh watched uh i know a lot of you have uh gone off now but thank you for those who did tune in at various times uh, during the night uh, even though we weren't successfully able to stream to uh, YouTube because it's uh, we haven't done it before and there's uh, a lot of a lot of things technical things we've got to figure out but this live stream will be up or is up on YouTube now if you're watching it uh, there uh, so super Saturday to to summarize the the Labor Party retains all of its seats and with the Perth pr- uh, uh, Perth probably still up in the air, whether it's Labor and the Greens, but probably the way the preferences go is that uh, Labor will uh, just uh, get over the line. Uh, but it's clear that Bill Shorten's leadership is secure after tonight. Uh, he'll be feeling vindicated that his strategy to date uh, has worked, and he'll be confident that this will be replicated in a federal election. Malcolm Turnbull will not go to an early election now. He will hold on for as long as possible, uh, possibly until May next year for an election. Uh, obviously, he wants to be Prime Minister for as long as possible, and if he is going to lose, then he'll delay the election until 
the, the last moment. But uh, uh, Super Saturday, it ended up being a super night for the Labour Party. Uh, they can now move on from the citizenship uh, saga and look to the uh, election uh, next year. And obviously with the result in Mayo and the performance of One Nation in Longman, it is clear that the, the minor parties are here to stay. Independents, uh, minor parties, they can still cause significant uh, electoral waves. And although it'll always be the, the, the major parties, there'll always be the, the minor players that uh, pop up from now to now. But on behalf of The Unshackled, it's been great to have your company tonight. We'll see you again for the next live stream, which is likely to be the Victorian state election, which is shaping up to be a really, really brutal contest. And so we'll be covering that in detail uh, for The Unshackled. Make sure uh, that you, if you haven't already, like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, sign up to our email list because we'll be producing plenty more uh, content covering more events on the ground here in Melbourne and of course ramping up our shows and podcasts. So thanks everyone for your company and we'll see you next event. This has been an Unshackled live stream. View all our previous live events at theunshackled.net forward slash live streams. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.